the way it's supposed to look to me. All right, let's do it. Thank you to everyone. This is the call to order of the open public session of the Harupa Unified School District Board of Education. What time is it, please? It is 6.03 p.m. on Monday, March 8th, 2021. Mrs. Worley, would you please conduct the roll call? Karen Bradford, present. Melissa Ragel, present. Dr. Eric Dittweiler. Present. Robert Garcia. Present. Joseph Navarro. Present. Roll call for student board members. Darcy Marquez. Samantha Melindres. Present. Angelina Sanders. Present. Darian Warhoff. Present. Staff advisors, Elliot Duchon. Present. Dr. Trent Hansen. Present. Paula Ford. Present. Dave Dubrowski. Present. Daniel Brook. Present. Thank you. Now the flag salute, please. And when we are finished with that, please remain standing for moments of silence. The flag salute will be read, led by Trustee Dittweiler. The allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight, we remember and honor the lives of those who gave service to our district and those who are just beginning their impact upon our world. Sandra Ruwain was a former Harupa Unified School District board member from 1989 to 1995 and president who passed away on February 8th. Jonathan Magdaleno was employed with our district from 2006 to this year. He passed away on February 28th. We mourn two students. Eolani Olivia Ramirez Muniz, who was a fifth grade student who passed away on February 11th. Angelica Marie Cano, who was a 10th grade student who passed away on February 14th. Every loss is tragic to a family and especially so for those who had yet to reveal their specialness and potential. Please join me in moments of silence for their memories and loved ones and families. And please remember to be grateful for your own blessings. You may be seated. Our inspiration tonight will be provided by my husband, Clint Bradford. We can't hear you. Not yet. Good evening. Yes. Senator Robert Kennedy made this speech to the young people of South Africa on their day of affirmation in 1966. He, his overhaul trip brought much attention to the problems in Africa and was a uh, worldwide success. The speech shook up the political situation in South Africa and received praise in the media across the planet. It's often referred to as one of his most famous speeches. 
Just two portions from it, please. Few will have the greatness to bend the history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events, and then the total of all those acts will be written in the history of this generation. And the future does not belong to those who are content with today, apathetic towards common problems and their fellow man alike, timid and fearful in the face of new ideas and bold projects. Rather, it will belong to those who can blend vision, reason, and courage in a, in a personal commitment to the ideals and great enterprises of America's society. Thank you. Thank you. Moving into the agenda, let's have reports from closed session, Mr. Brooks. Thank you, President Bradford. In closed session, by a unanimous vote of five to zero, the board voted to appoint as high school assistant principal, Ms. Nancy Reyna, who we're proud to say is a product of our Leadership Academy. Congratulations, Ms. Reyna. And also in closed session, also by a, a unanimous vote of five to zero, the board voted to appoint Mr. Kevin Corridan as a high school assistant principal. So we're very excited to see both of them move into that position here in Harupa. Thank you, President Bradford. Thank you on your wise decision and welcome to these individuals. Item 1A, welcome. Agenda item 1, oh yes, 2021 student board members, Mr. Du what? And one more report out. Oh, thank you, Mr. Dubrovsky. Absolutely. I'm not used to that. In closed session, the board in a 5-0 vote agreed to a settlement in special education dispute oh. OAH case number 20210101441, resolving all issues in the dispute. Also in closed session, the board in a 5-0 vote agreed to a settlement in special education dispute OAH case 20210101345, resolving all issues in the dispute. Thank you. Thank you. Now. Now. Mr. Dushan. Thank you, President Bradford. It is my pleasure to welcome virtually our student board members. We are so happy to have you here. So let's start. I don't know how you see the screen, but in my upper left is Samantha um, Lendis from, um, I wrote this, Patriot High School. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, happy Monday and happy International Women's Day. It is always a pleasure being here and informing you all on the amazing and fun events happening at Patriot. This new month of March is definitely flying by. This past February 25th, Patriot hosted our traditional Future Warrior Night for incoming freshmen. This exciting event was webcasted virtually and gave the incoming class of 2025 the opportunity to learn more about the Warrior Way, AP classes that they could take, and programs that they could sign up for. Future Warrior Night was split into breakout sessions where students and their parents could join up to three different informational sessions. It was truly a great success from all of our staff and students who volunteered, including ASB, Link Crew, and AP Scholars Club. Another update that I would like to spring upon relates to our cross country and tennis teams that have been working strenuously and dedicating their time and effort towards competing. This past week, our cross country team finished their season with a great P-dub. <laughs> Big congrats to our coaches, as well as our senior athletes, who are true student leaders, keeping the team safe, positive, and focused since their conditioning started last June. In regards to our tennis teams, our girls team recently competed at Harupa Valley, so I would like to give a shout out to Jags for being such great hosts. Also, if anyone is interested in seeing some clips or photos of our teams practicing and competing, feel free to check out our Instagram pages at patriot underscore JUSD and at patriot.asb. On the same topic of sports teams, I am so excited to announce that this month we will have a few more sports, sports teams that will begin practicing and also soon to be competing. These teams include football, water polo, baseball, softball, golf, soccer, track and field, and swim. We hope that with COVID-19 cases down, our teams will be able to continue to safely practice and continue on in their seasons. Nothing but the best of luck to our great and inspiring warriors who continue to bestow the core values through the athletic performances. Now, I know that I have spoken many times about the virtual rally, but ASB is so excited that it will finally take place this week on March 9th and March 11th. 
Through the Decades Rally will be showcased during advisory during both of the days. This means that on March 9th, we will show the first half of the rally, and on March 11th, we will be showing the second half. We cannot wait to show you all what our ASB program has been working hard on. To prepare our students for the rally, ASB held a Jeopardy game this last Wednesday during lunch to heighten more school spirit. This game tested students' knowledge on the decades of the 50s, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. Also recently, our theatrical team took part in the virtual Chapman Shakespeare Festival competition and won outstanding technical design, excellent monologue, outstanding individual performance in a scene, and honorable mention for, sci for scene design. These are all prestigious and exceptional honors and awards. Patriot would love for you to join us in congratulating our theater students and their outstanding efforts. Lastly, March is an exciting month for our seniors. This is a month when our seniors will be receiving college admissions from their colleges and universities in which they applied to last fall. It is amazing to see my friends and fellow peers earn acceptances to their dream universities because this is the path we worked towards these past four years. On the topic of seniors, caps and gowns are ready for seniors to purchase and place their orders. They can also purchase this year's yearbook in which our yearbook team has been working hard to compile and create. Finally, with the last update from JUSD, our seniors are excited that there is a possibility of having an in-person graduation on May 25th and May 26th to celebrate all our accomplishments. And sorry that was long, but that is all that I have for you today. And thank you so much for having me here. A few steps here. Thank you. And now I'd like to welcome our newest um, student board member, Angelina Sanders from Nueva Vista High School. Thank you. Hello, I'm Angelina. I'm the board rep for Nueva. So the first thing to go over today is that Nueva, we usually do community service most of the time, but since COVID, it's kind of difficult now. So our ASB has been keeping that tradition and going to Sunny Slopes virtual meetings as well and getting to read to them once a week, every week. Um, along with that, we have also done our Valentine's Day for veterans that we do every year. Here, as you could see on the Horizon video that me and one of my fellow peers, Jose Bombello, was also featured in. Along with that, we are keeping our tradition of keeping our fun Fridays. So like this Friday is one of the um, since this Friday is also our end of the quarter for third quarter, we have lots of people graduating, including myself. Um, along with that, we have our College and Career Center that has doing a great job with keeping students in touch with, with getting information about college and their FAFSA. Ms. Morales, our College and Career Center attendant, or yeah. <laughs> Attendant has been reaching out to everyone and is doing a great job of that. She's making sure everyone's FAFSA and CAAD and AA applications are good. She had just hosted a JUSD to RUCC Senior Day, which was with every student from, from each high school. And along with that, oh, Nueva is also preparing for the upcoming WASC -E test that we'll be using this year. So that is all I have for you guys today. Thank you for having me. It's so nice being on this board. And thank you so much, Angelina. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Next, I'll call on um, Darian um, who, from Haruka Valley High School. Nice to see you, Darian. I know you can't see us, but it's <laughs> nice for us to see you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and happy spring. Uh, there's so much exciting news today to share today for Herbert Valley High School. First of all, I want to recap um, our Love is in the Air virtual pep rally we had in February, since I wasn't able to make it to the last meeting. Um, this was our second virtual rally this year, and the video turned out to be amazing. We got participation from the improv team, staff, choir, um, students, ASB, and a lot more. And if you want to check out that video, you can look for it on Jack Spot's YouTube channel. The YouTube channel name is just Jack Spot. Um, sports have resumed at JVHS and tryouts and practices have been going on for the past few weeks from cheer, swim, baseball, basketball, track, tennis, and more. 
Um, our girls tennis team defeated Patriot 10 to 8 on Tuesday, February 23rd. So we're to go to our Lady Jags. I will continue to keep you all updated on sports, but for now, our Jags are practicing safely and distant from each other. Uh, there's also been so much great and hopeful news for our seniors. As everyone might know, we are on track to do a in-person graduation for the class of 2021. Also, as everyone might, might know, we are also there's also a possibility of reopening schools, and but we are still unsure of how that's looking. So ASB is planning events still virtually, and we have a lot of things coming. Um, Sorry, we have a lot of things coming, but we are not sure if this will be an in-person thing or still virtual. We are planning a virtual dance right now. Um, the theme is Island Getaway. We'll just have little events and a court, and we'll just like play games um, through um, like Google Meets. Other fun stuff that is going on for seniors is class gear, uh, sorry, <laughs> class gear, which includes shirts, sweatshirts, and masks. Seniors had the opportunity to buy the Jaguar all last month. And we were also still having a yearbook and senior ads are still happening. The deadline for that extra senior recognition is on March 19th. And lastly, top senior nominations for senior standouts are out and voting for, well, be coming soon for that as well. And all in all, I think we're all excited about all the great news coming our way. And I think we're all super excited for this pandemic to come to an end. And thank you and stay safe. Thank you, Darian. And um, finally, Darcy Marquez. Good evening. Good evening. I apologize. I was having many technical issues, but good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Happy March. I hope this month is filled with new opportunities for you all. In the past month, our career center has continued to hold active meetings and send out reminders for deadlines and scholarship opportunities for our student body. We have continued to participate in monthly raffles for seniors as they complete their FAFSA and Dream Act and college applications. Our winners have the opportunities to win gift cards to places such as Starbucks, Target, Jamba Juice, In-N-Out, or even winning pair of shoes or Rubuto gear, such as face masks. Congratulations to our past winners, David Chavez, Dominic Martinez, Angela Lopez, Jesus Valades, Alexandra Rochin, Daniela Hernandez, Angel Rodriguez, Victor Garcia, Brandon Somoza, Jessica Marin, Kiara Najade and Ismail Maldonado. Our next raffle will be held via Zoom on the 16th and all seniors and staff are encouraged to join. The month of March holds much improvement and further movement within our new house system. Allow me to introduce each house starting with the blue house, RI, green, Kaizen, purple, Pelotis, and red, Quest. The houses have started to host hangout sessions and it has gone smoothly and hope to continue participating in hangout sessions to collaborate amongst each other. Our food drive started today and students are able to win points for their house when they donate and a walk challenge named 30 for 30, which consists of encouraging students to walk 30 miles in 30 days in order to win points for their houses after accomplishing this while still staying active and healthy. As for our athletes and coaches at RHS, our athletics will be starting again with, the, with limited spectators for the spring season. We would like to congratulate our astonishing faculty member, Ms. Martin, who is part of the math department, as well as the math leads advisor for earning the title of teacher of the year. It is very well deserved. During advisory, students have continued to work on their base training courses in order to continue improving their communication and self-reflection skills during these unfortunate times. Our yearbooks have been available for students to purchase as a Google form was sent out through email in order for clubs, students, and staff to share and sending pictures and recognitions they would like to be included, as well as senior portraits. Although the circumstances with the virtual school year may not have been what most wanted, especially seniors, we have hope for an in-person graduation on May 24th, 2021. But with nothing secure or official, we will hope to at least attend a drive-through graduation. It is all a matter of waiting and being patient for the day we get to celebrate our accomplishment of graduating from Maruto High School. And that was very long and I apologize. And that is all, thank you. And we enjoyed every second of it. So thank you all. It's such a pleasure to have you be part of our meeting. Thank you, Mr. Dushan. We are now at agenda. Agenda item 2A, 
recognize site and district teachers of the year. Mr. Brooks, please. Thank you very much. Uh, tonight, as you said, it is my pleasure to present our district teachers of the year. Um, obviously with our current circumstances and the requirement that we meet social distancing measures, we're unable to help hold the kind of in-person celebration that we would typically like to, to hold to celebrate our teachers of the year. It's a lot like the acknowledgement that we gave our classified management and confidential employees of the year back in December. But tonight, nonetheless, I'm very proud to be able to present for you all the site uh, teacher of the year as well as our district teachers of the year. So first from Camino Real Elementary, we have our first grade teacher, Ms. Shireen Turner. <laughs> Next from Glen Avon Elementary, one of our kindergarten teachers, Ms. Denise Sanchez. From Granite Hill Elementary School, one of our RSP teachers, Ms. Kimberly Lambert. From Ina Arbuckle Elementary, one of our intervention teachers there, Ms. Marisol Ria. From Indian Hills Elementary, one of our sixth grade teachers there, Ms. Tracy Skinner. From Mission Bell Elementary School, a fourth grade teacher there, Ms. Esmeralda Koslick. From Pacific Avenue Academy of Music, one of the instrumental music teachers there, uh, Ms. Sophia Hernandez Lynn. From Pedley Elementary School, one of our kindergarten teachers, Ms. Lucia Chavez. From Peralta Elementary School, a second grade teacher there, Ms. Alyssa Morales. From Sky Country Elementary School, one of our first grade teachers, Ms. Heather Hewn. From Stone Avenue Elementary School, a dual language kindergarten teacher, Ms. Andrea Servan. From Sunny Slope Elementary School, a kindergarten teacher, Ms. Carmina Cook. From Trough Street Elementary School, a first grade teacher, Ms. Bertha Lopez. From Van Buren Elementary School, a first grade teacher there, Ms. Allison Smith. From West Riverside Elementary, a third grade teacher, Ms. Veronica Villalobos. From Del Sol Academy, a seventh grade core teacher, Angela Katayama. From Harupa Middle School, one of our math avid teachers there, Rochelle Massey. From Miraloma Middle School, one of our SDC functional skills teachers, Ms. Aileen Septejan. From Mission Middle School, one of our music, she teaches both choir and band there, Ms. Jamie Lewison. From Harupa Valley High School, an art and CTE graphics teacher there, Ms. Desiree Warren. And from Patriot High School, a social science teacher there, Ms. Samantha Penny. From Rubido High School, math teacher, Ms. Christine Martin. And for Nueva Vista High School, a math teacher, Ms. Claudia McNain. And lastly, our, our district has the opportunity to nominate for county recognition, one teacher from each of those, those levels, from elementary, one from middle, and one from the high school level. And so tonight I have the opportunity to share with you and present our district overall teachers of the year for the school year. First, from the elementary level, from Granite Hill Elementary, RSP teacher, Ms. Kimberly Lambert. From middle school, Haruba Middle School, Ms. Rochelle Massey. And then from the high school level, from Nueva Vista High School, Ms. Claudia McNain. So I'll just close by saying congratulations to all of those recognized here tonight. They will all be receiving a plaque 
And as I said, the, those receiving district recogni recognition will be nominated for county overall recognition. And we think they're well-deserving. So we hope that, that they succeed at the county level. Thank you again. Mr. Brooks, when when you give those plaques out, it, it just these few moments just don't seem enough for what these teachers do. I think back about my teachers and how I can name them and, and the impact that they've made in my life. And especially in this year, what all of our teachers have been through, it's it's not enough just to say thank you. Agreed. <laughs> so thank you to an exponential factor. Item, agenda item 2B to recognize Anthony Gomez the middle school teacher, Mr. Dubrovsky, please. Thank you. Bilingual Vida Bilingue is a nonprofit organization that celebrates the achievement of educators in bilingual education programs. At their award ceremony, February 5th, one of Harupa Middle School's teachers was recognized for his excellence in bilingual education. We wish to congratulate Mr. Anthony, Anthony Gomez for such an honor. Congratulations. <laughs> And, and to him as well, please, thank you so much. I, agenda item three, board comments. Oh, what? Oh, gosh, I skipped over a very large one, didn't I? <laughs> it's, it's been a very trying year, as well as a very trying week. I. Uh, that was the Freudian slip, wasn't it, audience? Agenda item 2C, presentation on in-person instruction. Mr. Duchon. Thank you, President Bradford. Um, as you know, or don't, um, this last weekend, the um, Assembly and Senate, Senate Bill 8086 to uh, Governor Newsom, and he signed it. That bill, which I'll get into in just a moment, um, uh, provides for an opportunity for school districts to begin in-person instruction. So I kind of want to set the stage here for how rapidly things have changed over the past year. It is almost exactly one year ago um, when this board elected to close schools due to COVID, um, when the county health officer closed schools and subsequently when the governor closed schools. Uh, we now sit a year later, we have gone through multiple colors, multiple tiers, multiple metrics, multiple regulations from multiple agencies. Um, through the past year, our staff has poured through, through literally um, letters, recommendations, legal counsel, summaries of law from California Department of Public Health, the CDC, the Riverside County Health Department, the Riverside County Office of Education. Um, school districts have had reopening and closing and reopening and closing plans. One of my peers said they actually wrote four different reopening plans. As you will see in a few minutes, we stuck to the original one and modified it as we went. To put things into perspective, it is just three weeks ago that this county was in deep purple. Purple is when the county is seven cases per 100,000 or higher. It was, I believe, at its max over 100, 112. Maybe it was even hit 125. It was questionable whether those rates would come down to even allow in-person instruction. And no in-person instruction was allowed in this county, unless it had been approved in one brief period last year when the county was in red. Um, we are told that those metrics may change yet again. Um, over the weekend, the governor's issued two things. He has um, allowed teachers to be placed at the head of the line in terms of vaccination. He has also um, partitioned a significant number, and I forget the percentage, I believe it's 40% of vaccinations to be delivered to underserved neighborhoods where there have been high incidences of COVID-19 and low incidence of vaccination rates. 
um, through really heroic and pretty assertive efforts of our staff, we were able to offer a vaccination clinic and we so where most of our staff were vaccinated, many also went through other clinics and we are now being issued special codes for any of our staff that have been unable to attain a vaccination so far. Um, AB 86, as was the final bill, the COVID relief bill, provides $6.6 billion for school reopening. Uh, Mrs. Ford will talk about our share in just a moment. In order to, there are, it is parted into two parts, $2 billion, the schools offer optional, and when I say optional, it means the parents would not be required to send their students to school, only if they wish, but the school district must offer it to get this, these funds to pupils in grades TK through two if the county is in purple, and it is very likely the county will be in red by the time this, we would affect the plan if the board so chooses. And grades T through six and one secondary grade if the county goes into red, yellow, or orange. Students must also offer in-person instruction to students within the following groups, foster youth homeless, special ed pupils at risk, disengaged students, students without access to the internet. Um, Mrs. Ford will cover the next one. Four point, and that would be the $2 billion only if schools met a requirement of plans, including right now having a plan approved by the county health officer if the county's in red posting it and following a number of requirements from CDPH, which we'll cover in the report that follows. $4.6 billion for learning recovery, supplemental instruction and, and support and some of these um, funds cover over more than one year, but they are not ongoing. Mrs. Ford, could you talk about the um, availability of funds to Hulu Unified? Sure, so uh, for the two billion in-person instruction grants, uh, it was, both of these would be based on our local control funding formula, which means as a district, because we have a higher unduplicated pupil percentage, a higher number of students that are uh, fall into those categories of low income English learners or foster youth, we would receive approximately $6.5 million in the in-person grant. For the 4.6 billion funds that can be used through um, 2022, uh, August of 2022, those funds we would receive approximately $14.3 million. Uh, and the $6.5 million is also available through August of 2022 as well. Thank you. So I want to continue and talk about COVID transmission, particularly amongst students um, who would be coming to school if you so choose. Um, I am neither a doctor nor a scientist. So I, this is mostly taken from the California um, Collaborative on Educational Excellence and Dr. Naomi Bardick, who is chair of the Safer Schools Task Force in California. Yeah. Oops. This is what happens when you look at two screens at once. Um, the science, which I will not go into deeply, but um, ACE2 receptors are kind of like a catcher's mitt and they catch the COVID virus. Children, the younger they are, produce less, fewer ACE2 receptors than adults. So that elementary students produce fewer receptors than middle and high school, and high school produce fewer receptors than adults. Now, these receptors certainly have a function in the body, and it's their primary function isn't to get you sick, but to do other things. But in this case, um, the fewer receptors the fewer doors there are for the virus to enter a child or anybody's body. Transmission among or from students is not common. A couple of case studies, one is a single case, which is rather interesting. A nine-year-old French girl with co-occurring influenza and COVID-19 went to three schools, had 80 contacts. There were zero cases of COVID, but multiple cases of influenza. So for children, influenza is much more, um, they are much more susceptible to catching flu than COVID. A case in Australia of 10 early childhood centers, 15 schools, greater than 6,000 children, overall and adults, 
Um, the transmission numbers were very low. 1.2% of people got COVID. Greater than 90% of the COVID contacts and, and receptors were at the home. Transmission from child to child is 0.3%. From child to staff is 1%. Staff to child is 1.5% and staff to staff frequency is 4.4%. And fortunately, um, science has been very good to us in the past year and come up with viruses, that, I mean with vaccines that run from 65 to 95% efficacious and basically 100% effective in preventing hospitalization. Transmission in schools with high prevalence. There was a study in North Carolina. At that time, cases were 29 cases per 100,000, which is about two and a half times what we have today. The ABC schools was the group. They had three W's. Wear your mask, wait for six feet, and wash your hands. There were 35 school districts, 90,000 students, 773 cases, 32 cases of in-school transmission in ABC schools. There were three clusters and no masking in kindergarten, second grade. Um, no child to adult transmission was documented. Why do children transmit? Um, don't they transmit as efficiently? Well, there are a couple of physiological things. Children have um, smaller lungs. I think case in point, if I were sneezing, it would be a lot more dangerous than a child. Um, they seem to have less severe disease, probably due to the um, fewer number of ACE2 receptors, less coughing, less spread. They're shorter to, than adults, and as we have heard many times over the news, the COVID-19 virus aerosolizes and tends to be in the air. So if it falls from a lower point, it's not going to go up, it's going to go down. Now, I certainly cannot tell the board that there is a 100% possibility that children will not transmit it to one another or to adults. But I, I think these were comfortable statistics for the state safer schools task force to at least recommend to the legislature that laws be passed to enable school districts to open if they chose to, again, under very specific conditions, which we'll talk about as we move forward. Um, we have the next PowerPoint, please. So this is, oops, there you go. Um, we renamed this in-person instruction safety plan for a, a main reason. It was originally, and I'll get to the, the timeline in a second, drafted as a reopening plan where um, essentially a thousand districts, 53 county offices and multiple other agencies drafted reopening plans of the first course we stayed with ours throughout. So we renamed it in person because we have been open. We have provided instruction to students, albeit not in person. I think many of our, if not most of our students have received extremely high quality instruction under the circumstances. Um, obviously, I think all of us know the importance of the teacher in the classroom and the person to person is so important for I, I can speak personally, it's just for all of us. So the safety plan and that we are required to post this, if the county is still in the purple tier, we would be required to have it approved by the county health officers. So this has morphed from our original reopening plan to our in-person instruction safety plan. And again, it would only be implemented should the board decide to institute in-person instruction. I won't cover the preface. This goes back to our reopening. Again, alludes to some of the frameworks that we had to um, adhere to. Um, this little queue that looks like Disneyland starts way back in March, a year ago. It seems like many years before that. We sent out community updates. We started planning immediately. That happened to be our spring break. Over the break, our IT and instruction department provided a portal for parents to begin to at least have resources at home for their students to begin instruction. We began planning for reopening. Our teachers provided distance learning at all grade levels and for all students. 
and we had stakeholder input in a committee we, uh, of many people, I believe, Trustee Regal and at the time Board President Ortega were on that committee. Um, in July, the board had a presentation of the reopening plan. Community updates were set and we sat with bated breath thinking that maybe things would get better and we would reopen. Um, as it turned out, by October, there was a special study session. Um, there was a beginning of a fall surge and numbers were continuing. So school, the board decided to continue with distance learning. During this time, we met with CSEA and NEAJ at the points the dates are on there. And in December, we consulted again with CSEA. In January, well, actually, I, I will say for all the people who work in Sacramento, whether it was to their joy or not, um, I think it was the Thursday between Christmas and New Year's, the governor made a, a rather well-known speech that he wanted to reopen schools by February 1st. Everybody began scurrying about to have a deadline. It was a plan similar to what has been enacted in law, but not exactly the same. As it turned out, it never went into law. Any plans that were submitted essentially were moot. We continue to consult, consult with our labor partners, CSEA and NEAJ, sent out community updates. And in February, the legislation process began with SB 86. In February, again, we were consulting following SB 86, AB 86, which were paired together in various and sundry updates from the legislature, lobbyists, the county office of education, and anybody that thought they had insight into where the plan was going to end up. We continue to send out community updates to consult with labor organizations. So March I believe, 2021, I believe March 6th on Sunday, the governor um, signed SB 86, which we went over a couple of the parts earlier, that presents the opportunity for the board and districts across the state to go into in-person learning. Um, and I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Hansen, who will go back starting from our beginning reopening plan, unless there are any questions at this point. We'll try to leave parts in the presentation for questions if there are any. So uh, some of you might, uh, this may be familiar to some of you that were on previously on the board, but these were the uh, the elements that were established by our stakeholder input committee uh, early on in the process and was part of the reopening the original reopening plan um, last summer. So things the values that were established by the committee was to consider public health guidelines, which we know has um, you know changed from time to time. Continue to uphold our promise of learning without limits, putting our students first. Continue learning while maintaining our LCAP goals and student achievement establish protocols to keep our students, staff, and teachers safe, and then pursue uh, communication and transparency along the way. The priorities that were established by that committee were, were these five areas. So instruction, health and safety, technology, uh, the facilities and site operations, as well as communication. So the committee at that time uh, researched and provided input for three learning models which were pretty consistent with other districts, districts throughout the state. Those models were to reopen in a traditional model, bringing all students back and, and reopening uh, as in a traditional model as normal. Uh, to schools to reopen with a blended learning model. Uh, and there were districts actually in the, throughout the state that, that chose that model, somewhere in Orange County, San Diego, and, and other less dense communities throughout our state or to reopen with a distance learning model. And uh, at that time, the board chose to reopen schools in a distance learning model. And so we have been operating in that third model uh, this school year. So before I go into the health and safety, uh, some of the elements that were established by the reopening committee and that we're emphasizing now, I'd like to just show a, a video that we are uh, producing to push out to families if the board were to choose to uh, reopen schools. It'll bring some context to some of the, the information.
Harupa Unified School District looks forward to welcoming you back onto our campuses. But in order to do so, we have adopted the following safety measures. Signage is currently displayed throughout all campuses with safety reminders. Access to school offices will continue to be by appointment only. Face coverings are required to be worn while on campus and in the presence of others. Proper PPE supplies will be available whenever needed. Floor markers will be displayed to ensure proper social distancing is followed. Temperature checks will be available throughout campus, such as front entrances, offices, and even classrooms. Protective barriers in all offices to ensure the safety of staff members and office guests. Visitors and other volunteer support are currently suspended to reduce the number of persons on campus and in classrooms. Campuses will designate official pickup and drop-off zones, as well as proper entry and exit points to maintain small groupings of students that enter and exit our campuses. To ensure the safety of our students, no gatherings will be allowed in these designated areas. Students attending in-person instruction will be divided into cohorts. Each cohort will be attending in-person instruction on different days. With this model, all workstations and school supplies will not be shared among students. Classrooms will have desks and workstations spaced out to ensure proper distancing. A mobile protective instructor barrier will be provided in each classroom. Scheduled hand washing breaks will be included in the instructional day. Classroom doors will be kept open during the in-person instructional period as appropriate. Heating and air conditioning filters will be replaced regularly for high quality air filtration. Playground equipment will not be accessible during outdoor activities. Classrooms and all occupied spaces will be sanitized daily. There will be hand sanitizing stations in classrooms and high traffic areas. Access to hands-free hydration stations on every campus and designated areas for students that are exhibiting COVID-like symptoms. We will be continuing our free grab-and-go meal program at school sites. Once again, Harupa Unified School District looks forward to welcoming you back to our campuses. So as we talk about the health and safety, it really comes, uh, you know, the, there's really five areas that, are, that, are, uh, that we all focus on. Obviously, masks, face coverings, uh, social distance, hand washing, frequent hand washing, uh, ventilation, and then stable cohorts. So we're going to talk a little bit about those in, in more detail today. So uh, part of the health and safety precautions that will be taken are daily screenings by both uh, staff and students will be expected to perform self-checks prior to coming to school. Health and hygiene practices, uh, frequent hand washing will be encouraged. Scheduled hand washing times will be included in the instructional day. Hand sanitizer will be provided in all of our workstations and, and classrooms. Um, obviously, we have signage as uh, to remind students and staff to follow these guidelines. Custodial staff will maintain regularly uh, routine cleaning frequency, including night, every night uh, sanitizing classrooms, uh, well, actually all occupied spaces. So we'll be doing that on a daily basis. Restrooms will be stocked with the sufficient soap and paper towels as necessary for uh, frequent hand washing. And then uh, of course, as you heard, uh, shared items, supplies and, and things of that nature uh, will not take place in the classroom. So students will have their own individual workstations and supplies and those those stations and supplies will not be shared obviously the the buses as well those that are receiving transportation uh, due to the the directives in their iep will also be sanitized both in am and pm routes access to campus uh, you may have heard in the video volunteers and visitors will not uh, be allowed on campus offices will remain um, available by appointment only to reduce traffic and uh, the gathering and, and uh, interaction of, of individuals. Uh, students 
uh, will not be allowed to, to gather in certain spaces. Uh, families and parents and, and the drop-off times will not be allowed to gather in places. So those uh, small groups um, and large gatherings uh, will not be available or will not be, um, we'll be, we'll be following that as well. Signs and floor markings, obviously, as I, I mentioned before, administrative and classified staff will also help to ensure that the, the patterns are followed and that students are maintaining their distances and uh, meeting with families in the public will be conducted by telephone or video conference um, whenever possible. An, an important element as well is that playgrounds will not be accessible um, during outside activities for obvious reasons. Uh, stable group structure. So again, this is an important piece. Uh, stable groups, we, we will establish um, cohorts of students. So two groups of cohort uh, of students will be established, both the elementary and secondary level to help reduce the number of bodies in a classroom as well as on campus. The classroom setup, teachers will have a protective barrier in their classroom. Um, students and staff, are, of course, are always encouraged to wipe down their workstations uh, either before or after the workday. Desks will be arranged all facing forward to minimize face-to-face -face contact. And students will not share uh, personal items. Hand sanitizer, as mentioned, will be available in all the classrooms. Um, and then the use of drinking fountains will be su suspended except for uh, the filling of bottles. So we encourage students to bring their own bottles. We've installed uh, hydration stations on every campus uh, to allow for that. Ventilation is, is an important aspect as well. We currently, of course, our, our classroom ventilation is adequate as it stands. We use MERV 9 filters. However, uh, we are pursuing to change out all filters to the MERV 13, which is um, the recommended capacity uh, at all of our, um, with all of our units. Anytime, which we've talked about before, um, you know, if the doors can be opened or windows can be opened, uh, those are encouraged as well, just to help uh, with circulation. Uh, I think the, the question was asked previously by Trustee Navarro in terms of the, the windows that are operable in the district. Roughly 30% of our windows are operable in the elementary level, about uh, 57, 58% at the middle school and about 50% at the high school. So when those are available, of course, uh, they can be opened, uh, but those are those are like additional practices, right? We want to make sure that the, the circulation, the filters uh, certainly will do their job. We're also going to replace the filters at a much um, quicker pace. Usually we, are re we replace our MERV 9, nine filters um, about twice a year. The, these filters will be replaced quarterly. So much a stronger filter and, and change much more frequently. Face coverings and PPE. So all students and staff, including the visitors, vendors, anyone that was um, uh, on campus um, are required to use face coverings at all time. They'll be made available to staff and students when needed. Face shields will also be provided to staff with specific job specifications and some students with special needs. Um, obviously face coverings and other PPE are not to be shared and so that will need to be uh, managed as well. Um, Protective barriers will be installed in the classrooms and um, offices for teachers and staff use uh, as, as needed. Uh, of course, we know that there are some exemptions for the face coverings, and so those exemptions will be followed, but the vast majority of our students and staff will be required to be in face coverings. Um, one, of the, one of the things I'd like to point out here is that schools must exclude students from campus if they are not exempt from wearing a face covering under the CDPH guidelines and refuse to wear their face covering. So that will be the intent for those that uh, are not wearing their face coverings or complying with those guidelines and regulations um, that they will be uh, removed from that program. And the, co the protocols kind of continue with some of the safety uh, measures, but I'll let uh, Mr. Brooks take that part. Thank you, Dr. Hanson. As Dr. Hansen said, there are some uh, essential protocols and procedures that we would have in place in order to ensure that we're complying with CDC guidelines, CDPH guidelines, as well as uh, recommendations from the Riverside University Health System, our county public health department. 
Uh, first and foremost, one of those has to do with uh, protocols that we follow in when um, a student or a staff member is presented with one of four different scenarios. These are the things that could come up um, potentially with exposure to COVID-19. So the first one, um, without reading to, to all of you, first one has to do with folks who are their students or staff who have COVID-19 symptoms. They're just suspected of having COVID-19. Uh, that individual needs to be sent home or sent to the isolation room until they're able to be picked up and taken home. We recommend testing. And if they are positive for their test, they need to quarantine for 14 days. Um, and it, in that scenario, the school or the class um, both remain open. No school communication is, is, is given at that point because it's only a suspected case. The second scenario, close contact with a confirmed COVID-19 case. So that's somebody who has gone, they've been tested or a doctor has said, yes, indeed you have COVID-19 or this individual has COVID-19. They are sent home. They must quarantine for 14 days from their last exposure. I'm sorry, I jumped ahead to <laughs> number three. That's this is number three that I'm talking about. So the confirmed COVID-19 case infection, I'll take a step back here to number two, uh, the close contact with the confirmed COVID-19 case. So those are individuals who have been within six feet of an individual who we know has COVID-19. They have tested positive for COVID-19 for um, 15 minutes cumulatively within a 24 hour period. Um, if they have been in that kind of close contact, they're sent home, they need to quarantine for 14 days since that last exposure to that individual. We recommend for testing, uh, for our employees, we actually have required testing. Um, it does not shorten the 14 day period, however, we need to, it, continue to follow the guidelines and that requires a 14 day quarantine. The school, the classroom remains open in that instance. And um, we, it says here that to consider school or community notif notification of a known contact. Our current practice for our employees, because obviously it's only employees that we have on campus at this time, we do conduct that notification. We let them know that there is someone who's been on the premises or that they have been in close contact with. Uh, the third scenario there is a confirmed COVID-19 case infection. So when that occurs, this is someone who has tested positive. We, we are required and we do, we comply with this. We notify Riverside County Public Health Department. We isolate that case. We exclude them from school or from work. They go home. They need to, to stay away for the 10 days for, um, past the onset or the test date. We then work to identify contacts. That's the contact tracing uh, protocols and procedures. We work with them. We also work with their supervisor or their principal, or in this case, with students, who possibly their teacher to identify those they may have been in close contact with. And then we communicate with those individuals as well. Um, and we recommend testing of those contacts. We prioritize symptomatic cases. Um, it, again, that testing does not necessarily shorten the 14 day quarantine. Um, we also proceed to disinfect and clean the classroom, primary spaces where the case spent any significant amount of time the school remains open at that point. This is one case and the school remains open. That's what the guidance all says. The school community will, however, be notified that there was a known case via a letter or an email from the district. And then in the last scenario, and it's referred to um, somewhat above, is a symptomatic, symptomatic person who then tests negative or their healthcare provider, their doctor, their physician, provides documentation that explains that their symptoms are typical of a, a chronic health condition that they have. They have asthma and that's that's what their cost is attributable to. They may return to school or to the workplace after their symptoms resolve. So that cough needs to go away. The sniffles need to go away. Um, and they must not have a fever at that point and can't be using any fever reducing medication like Tylenol, et cetera. Uh, the school or the classroom does remain open at that point. Um, and again, we, we would typically intend if we've had a suspected case, a close contact to notify the community. Um, there are, however, times where we do need to consider a partial or a total school closure. Um, at this time, um, once schools return to in-person instruction, the, the law and the guidelines don't require that we would close again, it's simply because Riverside County goes back into the purple tier say. Um, however, it is recommended under certain circumstances. And so I will walk through the bullets here below. So. Um, the first one, within a 14 day period, if an outbreak has occurred, 
uh, in 25% or more stable groups in the school. So a simple math, if you have four stable groups in the school and one of them has had an outbreak, that school, the guidelines say to close that. Um, second bullet, within a 14 day period, at least three outbreaks have occurred in the school and more than 5% of the school population is infected. So those could be outbreaks in any, any grouping of cohort. However, if, if that has occurred three times and there were 5%, then um, then they do recommend a school closure in that case. Um, of course, Dr. Kaiser, our county public health officer, may also determine that a school closure is necessary based on various circumstances. Um, and it also, in that last uh, paragraph there, you'll see that the guidance also states that the superintendent has recommended that the district close if 25% or more of the schools in the district have had to close due to COVID-19. Uh, which brings us to staff and student testing. This, this is guidance that uh, Mr. Deshaun was describing. There, there have been frequent changes here in the last few months and, and even few weeks and even <laughs> in the last few days particularly in regard to the expectations for staff and student testing. Um, this chart um, captures the most current guidance, which says depending again on those, those tiers, um, in a yellow, orange, or red tier, you, you are required to um, conduct or ensure that symptomatic and response testing occurs. So that means if someone is symptomatic of COVID-19, then we, we require that they go and get tested. Um, and we have currently been, been uh, conducting that with our employees who are working on site. Um, for purple, and, and this, this is a subject of some discussion even, even now, but um, it recommends that if a school is open and uh, in the purple tier that you have symptomatic and response testing as well as a screening for asymptomatic um, testing um, every two weeks. And that's for all staff and students who are in person. Um, again, we, we're expecting, as Mr. Deshaun said, that very likely we will not be in the purple tier um, in the next uh, next couple of weeks. At some point, we, we are expecting that we'll be in the red tier and we would not be beholden to the, to the requirements in the purple tier testing. And that brings us to um, Ms. Fords. May I ask a question first, Mr. Brooks? I'm, I'm wondering how this looks. Do teachers stay in their their classroom or do they get to go in the teacher lounge or or do they have staff meetings anymore? That's a great question. So our, our intention at this time is that staff meetings would continue to be held virtually as they are right now in order to maximize social distancing. Of course, um, teachers do need to be able to use the facilities to, to eat their lunches, that sort of thing, but they would be expected like all staff members to um, maintain social distance. We want to avoid um, you know, times where people might be eating or drinking in proximity with one another and with their masks off. So the lunches and breaks and that sort of thing should, should be avoided. What, what do we do about teacher social emotional health? Yeah, that's, a, that's also a very, very pertinent question. Um, yes, we, we, we are working with our association and are also working with our, our Joint Powers Authority, uh, REAP, that oversees our health and welfare benefits for the district. They provide a lot of support through um, what are called our employee assistance programs. And they provide a lot of free opportunities for our employees to receive mental health or encouraging or emotional support and other resources. Okay, well, they, they get to see their students during the day and that's encouraging. Thank you. President Bradford, I got a question. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Brooks, so on the last slide, there was a, a bullet point on there in the purple tier that uh, asymptomatic testing every two weeks. That just means everyone gets tested every two weeks in the purple tier. Yes, sir. That's correct. And if we go, let's say we go back into the purple tier, that would continue. We, under the current guidelines, we would, if we were to open in the purple tier, we would be beholden to that. Um, it, it, our understanding that the new law SB 86, if we were to reopen in person by March 31st, um, we, we would actually not have to conduct that, that testing cadence is what those, those kind of patterns of testing are called. We would not have to conduct that in the purple tier. Okay, thank you. And who would be responsible for the testing? Would that be done, Mr. Goffis, where would that testing be done? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. We, we've actually been uh, working on pulling together a plan with what's called Valencia Branch Labs. They're a state-sponsored laboratory, and they would provide the tests, 
the test kits, all of those kinds of things, as well as guidance for how to conduct a test. And we would designate two sites in the district where testing would be administered and then received, and then we would uh, deliver it to Valencia Branch Laboratory, and they would um, then give us the results. And will we accept testing from people's own healthcare um, providers? Yes. Can you clarify who is we taking the test? Is that one of our staff being appointed, or do we bring in a nurse, or is this something just administered with the mouth swipe? Yeah, so the, the test has to be self-administered, and so Valencia Branch Lab, they, they are able to uh, basically conduct like quality control <laughs> uh, to a lot of education for our staff members who could help to observe that, um, depending on the decision that the, the, the board makes. Um, we would need to possibly negotiate with, with our employee associations who would be responsible for doing that um, observation and then who would actually be delivering those tests back to Valencia Branch Lab. Okay, and that's just for staff only, not for students? It would be required for staff and students in staff the purple tier. Okay, thank you. Just by way of information to currently <clears throat> all of our athletes in order to compete with another school have to show up at the competition with a recent um, negative test for COVID-19. So it's on them. So, and, and there's no, there, thus far, I don't think we've seen any accountability program for this. I think it's really to your very best. And that, that testing for athletes applies to high contact sports, which currently would be football and water polo. Football and water polo. Okay. Just one more question. Um, I don't know if it's going to be covered later in there, but we saw in the video the, the custodial staff cleaning the rooms. Are teachers going to be required to clean the rooms or are students cleaning their own desk or how does that look like? Yeah, we'll, we'll encourage staff members and students to, to clean their own area, but the responsibility for cleaning will remain with custodians. So that, lead, that leads into my area here. So that was perfect, perfect timing. Um, in August, all staff received training uh, via video on how COVID-19 is transmitted and safe practices to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Staff working with sanitation and cleaning equipment, as you can see here in, in one of the pictures, received additional training and they have been sanitizing classrooms, offices, and common areas throughout the school year. In January, all staff also received the district's COVID-19 prevention plan and had to indicate that they had read through that plan. Signage, as you, as you can also see in the picture, has been posted at entry points to inform parents and staff of the expectations uh, uh, for safety measures, such as maintaining six feet of distance, wearing face coverings, and then additional signage will be provided to sites uh, to uh, include you know, those, uh, those uh, high traffic areas to ensure that there's social distancing and they know the flow of, of the traffic patterns. The communications department will provide educational videos on classroom and campus safety measures to share with staff, students, and parents. And district and site administration will continue as, as they have been um, to train, monitor, and enforce the district's COVID-19 safety plan. Now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Dabrowski. Thank you. And I'm going to talk about the program and the instructional schedule. And there were some considerations that went into the development of our schedule. First and foremost is our the, the makeup of our classrooms right now. Here we are in March, two thirds of the way through the school year. And in every one of our classrooms, we have students whose parents would choose to remain in virtual instruction should the board continue to return to uh, in-person instruction and we have students who would choose to come in for in-person instruction so the only way to provide for a student uh, for teachers who would teach the virtual students virtually only and the in-person students in person only would be to change around all of our classrooms to survey parents to determine which students wanted to return which students wanted to remain virtual and then transfer Teachers, but that level of disruption here in March, um, given the relationships that our teachers have developed over time and, and all the things that have gone into this school year would not be a good option for us. So we, we decided first and foremost that we needed a schedule that would enable our teachers to remain with their students. Um, 
And that left essentially two big options. One being a blended or hybrid learning where the teacher teaches in-person students some of the time and virtual students part of the time, or a simulcast type opportunity where the teacher would teach both in-person and virtual students at the same time. So we researched both options, looked at the research around the effectiveness of, of simulcast situations, um, talked to some of our, to our labor partners, talked to some of our staff development partners who work with districts throughout the country and asked their experiences with both models um, and, and observed some simulcast classroom examples and how that was working. And that all led us to the consideration that the simulcast option was not the best option for us, but a blended or hybrid model would be the, the superior option for our students at this point in time. So go to the next slide. Oh, wait, that's me. All right, so we have a video for you narrated by, by our uh, Lisa Hansen, one of our teacher on the special assignments. The following will provide a basic topic. overview of the district's proposed. Can we go back to that last slide first before we start that video? So, so as, you, as you take a look at the video, many of you have seen other districts who are working on reopening plans, you've seen other schedules, and you know that they are complex and difficult to sort of boil down and understand. So as you, as you watch this video, know that this video is prepared to go out to our families to help explain our proposed schedule should the board decide on in-person instruction. And we'll be available to our elementary and our secondary parents in both English and Spanish and we'll walk them through the way that a typical schedule would look. And as you watch that video, I just wanna foreshadow what some of the icons mean. There would essentially be three student groups. There are our virtual students represented in green. And for the in-person students, they're separated into the two groups in order to allow for social distancing in a classroom. So you have your blue group and your orange group. And the types of instruction that they would be receiving would be in-person um, represented by the faces, synchronous instruction represented by that computer screen with, with the face in it, and asynchronous instruction represented by the computer screen alone. So as you see the graphic um, video and, and you hear the, the explanation and the narrative, know that those are the things that you're looking at. So at this point, we will stop and show the video. The following will provide a basic overview of the district's proposed blended, sometimes referred to as hybrid instructional schedule. This visual representation will outline what learning would look like for students and families who select an in-person option and for those who select to stay completely virtual. Regardless of choice, the plan is to continue to provide a supportive learning environment for all Harupa Unified students alike. We will begin with our most important focus, the students. Students who select to return in person would be divided into two groups. They are represented here as the blue cohort and the orange cohort. Students who choose to remain completely virtual are represented in green. Regardless of whether they are part of the in-person or virtual cohorts, all students will continue to engage in remote learning synchronously and asynchronously every day of the week. Synchronous meaning students receive live teacher support while working remotely and asynchronous meaning students work independently. Let's begin with the elementary schedule. In the initial weeks of the transition, which would begin March 31st, teachers and students continue using their existing schedules on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, but utilize the remaining days of the week to begin easing into the new routine. Tuesdays and Thursdays would be split into AM and PM blocks. On Tuesday in the AM, the blue cohort would attend in person while the green and orange cohorts remotely engage in independent asynchronous learning. The PM block would be when the green and orange cohorts receive synchronous live teacher support while the blue, uh, the blue group uh, works independently. Come Thursday, we flip flop. The orange cohort will attend in person in the AM while the remaining cohorts work asynchronously. Then in the PM, the green and blue cohorts work with their teachers synchronously while the orange group works independently. After a couple of weeks in this transitional phase, we would expand the new schedule into the remaining days of the week. Starting April 19th, Monday's schedule would replicate Tuesday's schedule and Friday would mirror Thursdays, creating a two-day instructional block for each in-person cohort. 
while our green virtual only cohort would remain consistent throughout the week. Let's take a look at what a student would experience in a week's time of this blended schedule. We'll use Blue as an example. Monday morning, Blue attends school in person, then works remotely on independent work in the afternoon. Tuesday morning, Blue continues in-person learning, then again works remotely on independent work in the afternoon. As we can see here, for the remainder of the week, Blue's going to work remotely. Wednesday morning, Blue would check in with the teacher synchronously, followed by independent work. Thursday morning would be independent, followed by synchronous learning with the teacher in the afternoon. And that very same pattern would uh, follow on Friday. Similar to elementary, the secondary schedule would include a transitional phase. Starting the week of the 29th, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday schedules would remain the same as they are now. Tuesday and Thursday mornings would also remain the same. However, Tuesday and Thursday afternoons would provide a student support class for in-person cohorts, blue or orange, one day each. Students who choose not to return in person will continue to word, work asynchronously exactly as their schedules have been since the start of the second semester. Starting April 19th, the PM in-person student support class schedule would expand to include Mondays and Fridays. It is important to note that our elementary and secondary in-person and virtual schedules are student focused, designed to support academic, social, emotional, and physical needs during these critical final weeks of school. Arupa Unified is committed to continue to provide students and families opportunities to learn without limits. So that explains the proposed instructional schedule. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about the specifics. There are, there are a couple of minor changes that have come about recently in discussions with our labor partners. One would be that um, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, the week before the first day of in-person instruction, we would shorten the synchronous instructional time for our students in order to give our teachers time to get into their rooms and prepare their rooms and be ready to welcome students back on Thursday, April 1st. So that change would happen those, those three days prior to the April 1st opening. And then also, as she kind of mentioned on the Wednesday schedule, that day would be shortened synchronously as compared to Monday and Friday, um, where students would have a morning meeting, they would check in with their teacher, and then uh, they would continue with their independent work, uh, allowing the teacher time to prepare for the, the upcoming in-person uh, instruction that's coming up. So with that, I'm happy to answer questions. Susan Bradford, I have a question. Uh, Mr. Dubrowski, maybe this is for Dr. Hansen too. Uh, in the first video that Dr. Hansen played, there were, you would see the orange and the blue. Uh, so one day the blue used certain feet and then the following day, well, the, when it's time for the orange group, they would use different feet. Is that correct? Yes, so that means that a student would only have their own, only that student would use that seat. So the blue seats would be used by the blue groups, that would be their seat, and the orange seats would be used by the orange group, that would be their seat, so thank you. I have a couple questions. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a couple of, well, I have a lot, but I'm going to break them down over the two meetings. The kindergarten class, I understand there's some split classes. Has that been factored of how are the, the TK classes? So they have a morning and afternoon. What is the adjustment going to look like for the staff? Is the desk going to be sanitized and then allow the students in? Yes, we're working with those few sites that do have both AM and PM kindergarten instruction to find alternate locations for one of those classes so that both classes would have their own unique space. Okay, and then this this is a lot to absorb and I think that there's a lot of, um, you know, not, I don't wanna necessarily say fears, just concerns. And how do we, is there a plan to make this less disruptive? Because, you know, we, we're receiving messages from staff the state testing, the spring break. So how do we make this less dis disruptive and encouraging for a staff to make it a smooth transition in order to get some students in their classrooms, especially the, the ones that need it, but also handle the virtual um, learning and, and make it as smooth transition as possible? 
Right, that's a good question. One of the, uh, the key elements in that is the phasing in process where students would return to school one day per week for the first two weeks and then it would expand to two days per week after that. And that was intentionally designed to sort of slow the process and allow students to ease back in, allow teachers to ease back in and allow everything to sort of flow smoothly in the return because it, it is a big change, it's been a long time. Additionally, our teachers have had a, a lot of opportunities for training in social emotional learning and um, you know, are, are very eager and ready to begin to re-engage kids in the room with them. So that, you know, those, those processes, it won't be that we come in after, you know, however many months it's been, sit down and we're gonna start a math worksheet. It's gonna be that we're gonna begin to build routines and build community in our classroom. And, you know, there, there will be a lot of activities that will take place to ease the transition for students as well as they begin to, to make their way back. Okay, and then based on the information, you're looking at approximately a third of the students will be in the classroom, which is typical classroom size is under 30 students. So you're looking six to nine students potentially in a classroom for in-person learning, correct? Well, it's hard to say because we don't know how many of our parents will choose, you know, in a particular classroom. But if you say there's 34 students in a class and if you Assume that, that in the neighborhood of half of the students choose to remain virtual, that leaves you 17 students, which might leave you eight and nine students in the two cohort, blue and blue and orange cohorts. So um, certainly given the way in which the classes are structured, there will be uh, under 15 students in every, every instance where class is happening so that you, know, you can maintain the adequate social distancing and safety. Okay, and then when this process, if, it, if the board votes to approve the in-person option with distance learning, is there a plan for each campus to have a committee or you know a walkthrough of what it's gonna look like when the students are being dropped off? I know the video displayed the student drop off, but from that point, especially if you're looking at our, our, our young ones that have never been on campus, they don't know where their classroom is, um, some, some excitement seeing their friends so have we you know is there a plan to have committees on campuses to ensure that everybody is well aware of what that action plan is for safety for everyone's safety yes that's absolutely that those that work has been going on for months so so principals and with key members of their of their school community have been working on those plans for how that would happen for quite some time and our um you know our, our maintenance department and, and dr hansen can speak to this have been working with school sites as well to you know, determine the best physical means of traffic and our principals are in the process of staggering the arrival time. Maybe, you know, a few grades will come during the first 10 minute window, then the few grades will come at the next 10 minute window and we've designated appropriate places for the entryway and the exit. Um, all that work has been has been happening. Okay, so it definitely will be lined out. So then everybody is well aware, but Absolutely. you're sure all principals are aware of it? Yes. Okay. I'm going to pause now and give you the answer. I, I want to go back though and answer one part of a question that you mentioned was about state assessments because on your agenda for Wednesday night will be a um, resolution going through Riverside County to protest that the State Board of Education has not sought a waiver from the um, Department of Education. Thus far, seven states have received waivers so that they are not required to do state testing under ESSA, um, Every Student Should Succeed Act. This Department of Education and California Board has not done so yet. And there's even talk of just boycotting testing. So I'm not suggesting that at this point, but we will be recommending that um, if your sentiments agree with ours, that students ought not to be tested this spring, that it's just not good for them, the test will be um, actually Mr. Dubrovsky did testify virtually to the State Board of Education. We are hoping the State Board will change their mind. It is not really prudent nor accurate at this point, but that'll be on your agenda. President Badford, may? Please. Yeah, same here with the, um, um, I have hundreds of questions, but we'll just keep it limited for now if possible. Um, back to the TK and kindergarten, I know a lot of them have group tables. So are all tables gonna be replaced for individual chairs and, and, and seating, do we have that available? Is that something we have to purchase? How does that look like? It, it could be either or. So depending on how many students uh, choose to return back, uh, they may have their own table to themselves. If there's a little bit larger group, then we can poach tables from uh, the upper grades, knowing that those sizes will be reduced as well. And then will we, um, 
those temperature checks that will be done in the car so the students won't their parents will not leave the students until we temperature check temperature check or how does that look like for each school or will that be different to school depending on their plan yeah temperature checks will take place upon entry of the school site so they'll be as trustee regal had mentioned they'll be um, different uh, entry and exit points so as they enter campus their temperature will be taken at that point. So say they failed the, the temperature checks, their parents have already left, gotten on the freeway. How, what's that look like about, I heard isolation room is a room. What, is, what does that look like in contact them and where are they gonna sit? They sit outside. How right, so like? it would be just like if, if a, a student had flu-like symptoms, right? So the protocol is to, to go to the nurse to, to, to take the assessment, to make sure that that, that is happening, call the parent and uh, have that student be picked up uh, as soon as possible. In the meantime, those students will be uh, isolated away from other uh, students. Okay. And then um, would there be any allowance or will there be any uh, on-campus spots for uh, asynchronous work? Because that's when they have to just go home and do. That would be something they would do at home. They would do at home. Okay. Um, and then well, we, we consider discipline policy. Actually, if I, could, if I could add to that answer, yes. um, the, the student support class that was described at the secondary level, as, as you know, those students would receive their synchronous instruction in the morning virtually okay. and would then come on campus where they could foreseeably be doing some of that work that was assigned during that synchronous period and receive some assistance from the teacher during that time. Or the secondary. Okay. Uh, and then we've um, come up with discipline policy and plans for non-wearing of masks and not you know three strikes you're out you're not coming back to school things like that or absolutely and, and we do have the virtual options so for any student who is who is unwilling to comply with those requirements and, and is unsafe mm -hmm. then we would move that student to the virtual option and, and i might have missed it could you just repeat one more time the um the, the timeline for teachers to be able to get their classrooms ready because a lot of teachers are concerned about having enough time to yes to get things ready i, I missed sure the, the first day of in-person instruction would be thursday april 1st okay so Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday would be a brief check-in. There's a requirement that students receive synchronous instruction every day. So there would be a check-in with their teacher. They would you know, receive their assignments, things like that. And then the teacher would have the remainder of those three days to prepare their room and get ready for welcoming students in on Thursday. Okay, thank you. That's it. Have my own questions. First, Dr. Hansen, Tell me what's in the disinfecting spray, please. Well, I don't know the exact chemicals, but the chemicals that were chosen came from the CDC's list of recommended um, uh, chemicals to use. Tell me about their toxicity, hypoallergenic. How right, are no. we going to inform parents what is in it so they can decide whether or not, what, what, how long do they linger in a room? Yeah, we could, I guess we could put something together, but no, it's your standard. we need uh, to put something together. Right. But the, the, the solution is what has been recommended by the CDC. Okay, so it's, it's completely safe for, for individuals, obviously, to be used in schools. Okay. And uh, let, let me just highlight, though, that this is not different from what we've used in prior times. Oh, okay. If, if, I, I still want it. Yeah, I, we can I'd do like that, but, but we're not introducing some new hyper powerful disinfectant. Okay, when I, see can, some, when I see something fogged in, in that closed yeah, area. Yeah, I know the spray thing. It's a little bit. The spray different. thing, yeah. yeah. You got it. Thank you. And um, Mr. Duchon, for the, as I hear more about the variants that are cropping up and getting closer. I'm wondering what were the dates on the studies that you referenced, if, if those included the variants or, or how reliable is, is that? I have a stack of paper. Um, we believe they're variable as, I mean, they're, they're reliable as of now. That was what put, was put forth. I don't have the dates and of course, you know, it's, it's our responsibility, even if we, don't have to, to monitor cases within the school. And I think that would be the true judge of what happened. 
not whether there is variance in the community, but are people getting sick? Yeah, what's happening here in 91752 or 92509? Yeah. Right, if it's whether it's the original or a variant or the Brazilian or the Californian, if children are getting sick or adults are getting sick, we have a process we, we must adhere to and a decision could come back to the board at any time. Sure, the Pedley Road variant. Let's okay. hope not. Welcome to our world. Yeah. Mm. Uh, trustees, time. other questions? Yes? Uh, Trustee Regal? Yes, thank you. It, at first, also, this is not just as disruptive for our, our staff, and I, and I definitely want to encourage something that, you know, brings sort of in person moving forward one day. But we also, also factor in some sort of child care at all the campuses, you know, especially the elementary schools, has that been factored for every campus? Well, we have childcare programs uh, and learning pods at this point, but they are not at all of our schools. They're sort of regionally located. So think together our partner in that as um, they stand ready to work with us to make whatever changes are necessary. And they're simply waiting on what this is, the decision is of the board. In fact, they've scheduled a meeting with our coordinator, Lorraine Mooney, uh, or, or director who, who manages that program for the day after the board's decision so that we can move forward in the best way possible. Mr. Dubrovsky, is, is Think Together considered child care or not? That's a good question. I know that as we opened the learning pods during this time, they fell under the child care regulations, but generally it would be a separate component because it has an educational component as well as an after school component. So it was a, it was a separate law, um, the, the ACES Act that, that funds it. So That's I'm, right, ACES. I'm not sure that it would really fall cleanly into either category, education it's, or childcare. It's a, it's a place where people can park their students. Well, where students can receive tutoring and homework support and academic. Okay. Okay. You know, speaking of the homework support, I know that we've had um, several neighboring districts and we've been um, contacted by the digital tutoring services. Is that something that we're going to factor in? I mean, I know that we can offer the camp uh, on the campus, but we not everybody's going to have that luxury or even the timing that we're going to set up specifically. Is that still going to be on the table as, you know, an online tutoring service that's available anytime? That is a potential option. I have met with the, the paper.com company and we've, we've, we're sharing back information right now and I'm, I'm waiting on a quote from them. So um, not, not sure whether that will come to fruition or not, but it's definitely something we are actively investigating. Okay, and I just have one more question. Okay. Um, could, could I slide something in there? How do, how do we make sure that monitor their safety protocol? The safety protocol of the tutoring company? Of that and think together. Well, we've partnered with Think Together for many years, so we have a just an active, you know, protocol for communication between that, and, and we work together to ensure that uh, the the online tutoring company we would ensure their safety. For example, a company like Paper.com, they they record all of their conversations with students, which are chat based, and that all of their employees are in fact employees and not independent contractors, and all of that information is available to us, so they have. There are there are monitoring systems in place to ensure student safety. Okay, no no cyberbullying. Thank you. Correct. Thank you. Excuse me. That's okay. Uh, one more question is for Dr. Hansen. Uh, the filters that you're that are being recommended for the classrooms. When will those be installed in all classrooms? They'll be installed before the first day of students returning to the classroom. And then what was the frequency of changing those? Quarterly. I'm sorry. Quarterly. quarterly so from twice a year to quarterly. And are we going to keep a log on that? I mean, so there's, just, there's just a lot of anxiety about it. So I want to make sure that it's yep. uh, clearly transparent to the staff that is working in that room. We and keep then, a log of that now, so we would continue to do so. Okay. And then um, the PPE, is that going to also be available in every classroom, the hand sanitizers or whatever they need? that will be available before they step foot in the classroom? Yes, that's there now and it'll it'll be replenished if needed before they get there, but on, on an ongoing basis. Okay, and with so many school districts now starting to um, consider opening, we know that there's gonna run a limited supply. Are we pre-ordering to ensure that we have the plexiglass, the rolling screens, and the hand sanitizers? I mean, we saw the, the 
toilet paper and paper towel issues last right. year, but I want to make sure that are we going to be ahead of that eight ball to ensure before anybody walks into those rooms, all those supplies are going to in fact be in stock and set up in each room. That, that's the plan. We have a lot in stock now and we'll continue to order. So uh, there hasn't been an issue. I mean, that's obviously at the beginning was very, um, very difficult, but that has kind of subsided now. But yeah, we have a, we have a reordering process that takes place uh, where we manage our, our inventory and then get new product uh, as needed. Okay, and then, I mean, even the sliding, is that a plexiglass? That's pretty neat. I think the teachers are gonna feel safe using that and that's something that's not gonna be an issue to get in stock for every classroom. So we we actually uh, do have uh, a bit of a of a backlog on that. We've had we've had it on order. Uh, we anticipate that it right now it, the latest information that we received was it should be be here no later than April second, which is the day after. However, we are um, we could provide face shields. Um, for in, in addition to the mask, we can provide face shields for all of our teachers. And we also have the barriers like you have there that would be available for teachers in the meantime. Yeah, we have, yeah, we have placed an order for those and those we can get more quickly. Um, however, we, we don't know that we won't have the actual full barriers before school starts, but they're telling us that they, they will absolutely have them no later than that date, which would be April, I think. Yes, yes. And that was due to the uh, the ice storm and everything that happened in Texas and the manufacturer was not able to get the, uh, the plexiglass. Mrs. Ford brought up a, a great point. We do have face shields for our, every employee or every uh, teacher as well. So those will be deployed to the classroom regardless. So they have that as an alternate if they'd like to use that instead. President Bradford, I knew the answer to your question was in the small print. It was on one of the slides. Obviously, they were the, the presentation was January 14th. All of the studies were completed before that. The um, one of the studies in North Carolina was November and December, uh, September and November. The other one was earlier. We've also, and I, this is not scientific, but the monitoring school districts that are open. There have been very few cases, but again, the proof is in the pudding. We don't know the answer. I, I remember the um, the study you referenced, but if, if, as you say, if all will move in target and it's right. going to change next week. I, I remember just anecdotally in the very beginning, the health department said, we don't know if children are vectors or not, which created a, a whole lot of alarm. We now know they're less likely to be vectors. So. <laughs> That's as scientific as I'm going to get because it's very difficult. And well, we, you we don't, don't have MD after your name, so that's no. fine with me. Yeah, yeah, um, but no promises, but some statistics. Okay. Thank you for citing your your sources, Mr. Duchon. Other questions? Okay. Shall we move on? Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see where I am. You're not finished, please. <laughs> just, just a few more. Okay, <laughs> please continue. I want you to inform us. Thank you. Um, so nutrition services, as you know, we have uh, had free lunches to all students. We're actually operating under the summer feed program uh, through USDA. Uh, and the, we have grab and go meals and they'll continue through both walk up and a drive up distribution so that they can accommodate you know any in-person students as well as our virtual students all foods are individually packaged we'll continue to do that to uh, be safe in that in that way social distancing and face coverings will continue to be required for them to uh, be served meals and the meal distribution times will make sure that those align with what the instructional time so that uh, students that are coming in at the secondary uh, schools would be able to be provided with a lunch or their meals prior to uh, beginning in person and then students that are coming in uh, or actually leaving from the elementary would be able to take 
the meals with them um, as they as they leave school. So we're very proud of our nutrition service staff. They have been serving nonstop since uh, the closure, you know, back in March of 2020. As far as transportation, in order to maintain a level of social distancing on our buses, only special education trans transportation would be provided. And this would be for students that have special uh, education transportation in their IEPs, uh, actually uh, spelled out in, in the IEP and written in their IEP. And to maintain as much social distance as possible, there will be assigned seating on the buses. We actually already have uh, stickers that are on seats to show where students can't sit and where students can sit. So that is uh, already placed on our buses. And then staff and students will be required to wear face coverings at all times. We will work with those students in special education that are not able to wear a face covering. And we will you know, provide some other type of barrier as much as possible or ensure that there is that six feet of distance. And for cross ventilation, a minimum of two windows will be open during each route um, so that you know we will get that cross breeze and you know that is, uh, airflow of course is very important uh, with COVID. And staff will continue to sanitize our buses daily which was what they are doing for our small cohorts that they are cohorts of students they are transporting right now. So this slide talks about our notification plan. There are a couple of different aspects to this. One, as you heard, and as you were able to see a little earlier, obviously our, we have a wonderful communications team here in Harupa who are preparing to disseminate a lot of the information that's included here in this plan specifically for parents, for the community, as well as for staff and teachers and others. Um, specifically though, we are also responsible for having a plan for how we communicate when as we, as I talked about a little bit earlier, when folks are, when our staff or our students are exposed, um, when they're in close contact with someone on campus, other, other pertinent kinds of information that, that um, we all believe and that the guidance says uh, individuals are entitled to receive and that families are entitled to receive. We have to have a plan for how we will communicate that. So um, one of the primary things we have to consider is, is ensuring that we are protecting people's privacy rights at the same time. And so we will, um, observe FERPA and HIPAA privacy rights and all of those communications. Uh, our employees through, throughout the pandemic when cases of exposure and things like that have come up, um, they are, have been notified directly by my office, by the Human Resources Office. That will continue to be the case. Um, when it comes to you know students potentially, family members, we will be working with site administration to communicate with them uh, as, as needed as the case may be. And um, another aspect it, it, overall, as you saw initially, the, the title slide for this talked about this being a safety plan. The state requires, the CDPH requires that prior to opening in person, um, that we um, create this safety plan and that in doing so and in building it and pulling it all together that we consult with our labor partners. And so you can see, obviously our classified employees are represented by CSEA Harupa. Our certificated employees are represented by NEA Harupa, and we have consulted with them specifically on the safety plan on the dates that are identified there. Frankly, we, we talk to them all the time, though. We talk to them every day about a variety of issues, but on, at, in terms of the safety plan, we consulted with them on the dates that are identified there, which we're expected to provide to the state as well as to submit to the county health officer um, when we provide this plan to them. Um, as a part of all of that, there are also some um, effects upon our employees, the decision where the board to make the decision to um, offer an in-person model. Um, there would be effects on our employees. We are always obligated to negotiate issues like wages and benefits, hours, other terms and conditions that are identified up there. But the other five bullets below that, workday and responsibilities that would be implicit in, in the, some of the schedules and other issues, um, how we would support teachers and staff through providing things like planning time and preparation time, as Mr. Dabrowski was outlining, uh, safety and health protections, all that Dr. Hansen described, as well as how we manage absences and leaves that are related to COVID-19. This is a unique, unique case and a unique situation, as well as how we would accommodate um, any of our employees who 
uh, may have medical issues or um, other health concerns that would qualify them for potential reasonable accommodation. Um, and those are all issues that we have to negotiate with our labor partners in CSCA and NEA Harupa. And, and um, we have undertaken that. I, I can't elaborate on that as much in a public meeting as I might wish to share, but uh, the board has reviewed those issues in closed session. All right, and for our students with disabilities, uh, should the board choose to reopen our IEPs, the, uh, meetings for those students would continue to happen virtually. Students who receive specialized academic instruction would would have that either virtually or in person, depending on their, their location for receiving instruction. Uh, related services such as speech and language, occupational therapy would continue to happen virtually so that those specialists would not be serving students over multiple schools and you know mingling cohorts. Um, in addition, the outside agencies would continue to follow health and safety guidelines for our students. In addition, we would we would continue to have um, you know support, social emotional supports for our families, um, for our students, both with our teachers and staff, and and through departments like our PICO department. One of the important like frameworks for that is the. CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. They have five competencies that are up there on the, on the in that graphic. Um, there are things like self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness. All things that students would regularly get during their time in a classroom. So all things that our teachers will focus on as students are welcomed back into the classroom to rebuild those things that students have not been able to get as much of during virtual instruction. And and as you know, our PICO department has expanded dramatically during this time and has worked to serve uh, a greatly increased amount of referrals, both in the areas of mental health support and in, in our um, family home visitation for our young students or, or pre-students. And they are you know continuing to expand and stand ready to provide support to our students once we welcome them back because we know that you know some of our students we, we may not realize some of their needs until we have have them back in the room with us so we are ready to do that okay and then uh regarding devices and connectivity as you know you know with us being uh being a one-to-one -one district for several years now we were you know um, prepared, somewhat prepared, I should say, best prepared we could be to go into the uh, virtual learning. Um, to, the district will continue to provide a Chromebook for every student and hot and hotspots to our families in need of internet connectivity. And we've been uh, adding additional hotspots as families request them. You know, throughout throughout this time, so we continue to do that. TK through first grade in person students. If they um, were to, you know, parents were to choose, the board were to go forward with in-person instruction and parents were to choose that for their TK through first grade student, they would pre be provided with a Chromebook in the classroom. So they would not have to um, transport a Chromebook to and from school. They'd have one at home and one in the classroom. For our second through 12th grade in-person students, they would, they would be required to carry their Chromebook if uh, the teacher needed that Chromebook to be for in-person instruction, they would be required to carry that to and from school. We would continue with all our current technical assistance options that we provided. Uh, and a lot of the assistance comes to our library uh, staff at the school, uh, as well as our technicians. And then uh, resources become available. The district will continue to update our families on additional programs that are offered for internet connectivity to make sure that, you know, we're providing that any options for low cost or no cost internet uh, support. And uh, I, I have to say too, I was very proud of our technology department for all they've done to keep the devices up and running for not only our students, but for our staff as well. And then last, that brings us to the end of the, the document, uh, which as I said, just a couple of minutes ago is, is our overall safety plan. Uh, in order to be submitted to the CDPH, uh, it, the safety plan itself is, is comprised of two additional items, one of which is the COVID protection program, which is required by OSHA. 
And that is the document. It contains actually a lot of the safety and health and hygiene information that we went over earlier, as well as a lot of contact tracing information. Um, that's what's required and has been in place here in the district uh, for, for several months. Uh, Ms. Ford mentioned a few minutes ago that that went out and was shared with all of our employees on January 4th. That's our plan for how we protect our employees uh, from COVID, as well as um, the, what the, the CDPH refers to as a school guidance checklist. And that, in large part, really drove and drives a lot of the items in the organization here in the overall safety plan. So those two items are included in the appendix, as well as uh, some additional resources um, that provide a variety of resources and, and reference material all in regards to um, COVID-19 and protection uh, at school. So I will defer to Mr. Deshaun. Thank you. Uh, thank you board members for being so attentive. I want to just close this with a couple comments. I was scrolling back through um, my text history of this. My first text went to Dr. Cameron Kaiser the Riverside County Health Department at 9.47 p.m. on March 12th, where I, as much as you can, and a text message got down on my knees and begged him to close schools. Because at that time, we didn't, we had the authority to close them, but without, we couldn't do it without losing money. But subsequently, I, my next text was at seven o'clock in the morning. He was very good about getting back to us. He has since met with superintendents in this county at least weekly every week since we've met with superintendents throughout the county weekly there's a meeting of state superintendents weekly i can't tell you we, we haven't really counted how many meetings in terms of seminars briefings legal briefings attorney briefings cdph briefings etc and as i've said it's been a, it's been very difficult confusing sometimes difficult to navigate and trying for every single person in this district, be they a parent, a teacher, a student, a principal, every, I think I can speak for every one of the members of this community. It has been a most difficult road to come down. It seems much longer than a year. Each step by every single person, I think has been centered on the concern for children first, our staff next and our community next, and to make sure that we have a safe and healthy community. Um, what we presented, what we have presented you, to you tonight is what's been an ongoing plan that is laboriously changed multiple times due to um, changing regulations, standards, and health conditions. And I, I think as President Bradford um, really alluded to, we don't know much yet about the variants, so we are not through. I cannot promise you that any certainty other than what we know today, um, we've given you up to date information. I hope you find it informative. We will try to supplement it with any research as you require it, any questions that you might want us to field, any other information that we can possibly get. Uh, I wanna thank um, really hundreds of people that at some point in some way were involved in getting us to this point. We believe the legislature and the governor has given us a fair opportunity. When I say fair, one with funding, one with safety, one with health considerations. And finally, I, I wanna say our concern is not only the academic status of our students, but the health of our students. And, and that's, if I go to bed worrying each night, it's for what we don't see. And I, I think as an educator, as a teacher at heart, what I don't see in students, what's going on in their homes and their lives is very disturbing. So I hope this plan gives you the information you need. I, I know you have a multitude of uh, comments coming up. So thank you for your time. And we're done with the presentation. Okay, we've been at this for two hours. I had a music teacher who said the mind can hear what the seat can endure. So I suggest we take a 10 minute break. It is now 7.55. Let's come back at 8.05. Okay. Okay, see you back here at 8.05. Muted. 
ஜாப் watching it she says she can hear it one of their mics on maybe
Thank you, everyone. We are reconvening at 8.10 p.m. with our IT reconnected. We will go back to the agenda item number three, board comments, and resume with comments from Trustee Regal, please. Thank you, President Bradford. Um, I'm just gonna keep this short as I know this is a long meeting. Um, I, <clears throat> I want to thank Mr. Hill for attending um, his class last week. They are um, sharing updates of registering for high school. And so um, what was really impressive is the students were messaging little conversations as they're getting some overwhelming information of, you know, registering for high school and the AGs and understanding that process. But I want to thank Mr. Hill and his students for um, being so cordial and polite and, and allowing me to listen in. And then um, we also had recently the Lions Club and the city of Herpa Valley organized a community cleanup. There was a lot of staff from Herpa Unified School District. So um, I was one of the volunteers and got out there and helped clean up our community. But I wanna thank those that took time out of their Saturday it, to help improve and clean up our city. So. Um, you know, I really appreciate that our staff is really coming forward to volunteer for those types of services. And then Mr. Bradford, thank you for um, your inspirational comment. Yes, Mr. Bradford, thank you for um, composing something so nice and, and sharing your inspirational comment tonight. I think that's the first time I've ever seen anybody from the public invited, it's usually a board member. So that was a first to see and I really appreciate it. Thank you. And then Angelina Sanders from, I think our high school students are gone. We actually have somebody from Nueva Vista High School coming in to represent all the students. So I look forward to hearing those updates. And then congratulations to the District Teachers of the Year, the nominees, and Anthony Gomez. Um, that's, that's quite an accomplishment for you. Um, and we are receiving, um, I, I don't wanna speak for the board, but I'm sure that we would all be in agreement that we are receiving a lot of emails um, addressing this specific topic of opening schools or continuing distance learning. And um, it, it really, we're getting so many, I can't respond to them all. So I just wanna share with our community and, and those that are listening, I, I read them. I just can't get to reply to them all. So don't think that they're being disregarded or ignored. We read them and we take them to heart and we factor them in with our decision. And as you know, we all have a lot to think about and so we appreciate your feedback and your suggestions. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Garcia. Thank you, President Bradford. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, actually, I'd actually like to congratulate uh, Ms. Nancy Reyna and Mr. Kevin Cordon, Cordon for their appointments this evening. Um, just know that the board has a uh, a lot of confidence in you and um, we look forward to great things. And again, uh, thanks to the students for uh, great reports. You know, those are some fantastic reports and I appreciate them. And again, Teachers of the Year, uh, the nominees and the Teachers of the Year, Ms. Lambert, Ms. Massey and Ms. McMaines, uh, thank you all for um, your dedication and commitment to, to this district and to the students. And of course, all teachers. I mean, it's hard to believe it's been a year. Um, almost will be a year in, in like, I don't know, five days that we that we were here and we shut down. And um, everybody's gone above and beyond and uh, including cabinet, staff, Mr. Dushan, teachers, um, and uh, obviously parents and students. I mean, it's been a tough year. And I guess we'll, we'll visit that topic uh, on reopening on Wednesday. I want to thank this, uh, Mr. Deshaun and cabinet for uh, your thoughtful report today. Very detailed, uh, all the research that you've gone into reopening, uh, you know, going on looking at other models and um, I think it's a good plan. And even though um, at the beginning of the year, I thought the hybrid was a little bit, uh, maybe maybe not uh, not a good plan. But um, looking at this uh, model you put together is uh, looks promising. So thank you, and uh, thanks thanks for those that are here today. Appreciate you being here. We look forward to listening to all your comments. Thank you. 
Thank you, Trustee Garcia. Trustee Navarro, please. Thank you, President Bradford. Um, pretty much will sound like I'm reiterating what my uh, fellow board members are here saying here, but I want to say that I have received emails from students, from parents, from teachers, even grandparents. Um, and just like uh, uh, Trustee Bradford uh, and uh, Ray Gold were saying that we can't respond to any of them, but I want to let you know that not one email has not been read, has not been heard, has not been considered, and not have been, been thought about by me. So I want to appreciate, say a thank you for those and keep them coming if you still have more questions uh, after this evening. Uh, I want to thank everyone that's here today, taking the time out of your evening. I know it's a long, long night, long time, long um, meeting to, uh, to sit through. So I look forward to hearing um, all your concerns and your questions uh, for the for us board. You know, regardless of our decision that we're going to make on Wednesday, I know that some of us will feel, uh, or you will feel alienated after this, but I want to ensure you that you've been heard that your thoughts, your concerns, everything has been heard and that, and that we will not take disregard any of your concerns or, or comments um, from that. And so just because your our decision might not go your way, just know that you've been heard and that we appreciate you very much. Um, we just want to congratulate all the teachers of the year. I appreciate the hard work. I appreciate all the staff here for the presentation. Uh, um, uh, I can go on and, and, and just talk about how the, the great uh, job that the staff has done uh, throughout the whole years. and. Um, but we have a long meeting, so I'll just cut it off there. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Dittweiler, please. Hi, I, I want to thank the, the now more than two dozen parents and educators who have emailed me with their concerns. Your positions were pretty evenly distributed between those who oppose reopening, those who want to reopen quickly, and those who took no ex position but expressed concern. In addition to personal safety and logistical concerns balanced against educational quality and mental health concerns, I heard concerns about complexity. Teachers from all three of these groups said that they did not want to try to teach in person and online at the same time, which I'm glad to hear we're not asking them to do. And parents, some of whom are also teachers, thought that a new convoluted schedule would be worse than the one we have now. This parent tries to remain amused by the similarity of the current school day to an Abbott and Costello routine. I can also observe that while there may be learning happening during asynchronous learning time, it's not likely to be on the lesson plan. Roll calls are long and tedious, and kids already, attention, already conditioned to have short attention spans doodle and daydream and miss their names being called. Clearly, what we are doing online now is not as good as what we are used to doing in the classroom. Well, we probably don't need high stakes standardized tests to tell us that. We should do a thorough assessment of what worked and what did not work and why if we can figure it out. Much of this could be done with focus groups of teachers and parents. And the quantitative metrics could be as simple as what fraction of students turned in what fraction of work in which courses in 1819 versus 2021. COVID-19 was a giant natural experiment from which we can learn a lot. We take the time to pause and reflect on what it is we really want before we rush headlong back into what we had. I heard one other specific comment that warrants being repeated here, and that is, what will the impact of bringing back large numbers of students be on our ability to educate those with the greatest need and whose needs we are legally and morally obligated to meet? That's it for me. Thank you. As for myself, I can never thank our teachers staff and administration of Herupa Unified for what you have been through this year. And for all of our parents sitting in front of me and those listening, the grandparents and supporters and fans and everyone who encourages the students. I think of the, the bus drivers, the crossing guards, everyone who encourages a child, thank you. You have no idea when they're watching you, when they use you as a role model and what difference you make in a child's life and how that will show up in five to 50 years. So thank you very much. And thank you for coming to let us know what your commitment is to those children. And Mr. Brooks for, let's see, for all of our teachers of the year whom we recognized Plus one, whom we forgot to mention, would you please add that person? Yes, as you said, unfortunately, one of our wonderful teachers of the year was missed 
Wait, wait, no, that's extra attention. Oh. The cherry on top. Yes, she is indeed. Um, from Rustic Lane Elementary, Ms. Deborah Provenzano. Um, I failed to mention her earlier. And on a personal level, yes. Sarah Trust. Sarah On a on a personal level, I I somewhat ironically and I'm embarrassed to say that I, I began my career as a teacher at Rustic Lane. I worked closely with Ms. Provenzano and she's one of the finest and most dedicated teachers I know. And she absolutely deserves all the recognition and celebration that we can keep on her here tonight. Um, she happens to be retiring here at the end of the school year and it's, I think it's a real loss for, for our district and for the children at Rustic Lane, but she has touched many lives and I think she deserves to be celebrated and recognized. And I, Ms. Provenzano, I think you're wonderful. I hope you're hearing this and I apologize for missing you earlier. She'll forgive you, Mr. Brook. Thank you very much. Moving on to agenda item number four, public verbal comments. This communication opportunity is included on the agenda of each regular board meeting so residents can make suggestions or identify concerns about matters affecting the school district or request an item to be placed on a future agenda. The Harupa Unified School District Board of Education encourages and invites the public to comment on items listed on its agenda or on matters within its subject jurisdiction. Public speakers have a right to their own opinions and neither board members nor staff will be responding to those opinions. The district silence should not be mistaken for agreement, but simply to avoid legal entanglements and or to protect the privacy of situations that may involve lawsuits, employee discipline or dismissal. Please be assured any serious allegations have been or will be investigated thoroughly. Any response from the board will take place during board member comments. Pursuant to JUSD's board bylaw 9323, each public comment submission will be allowed three timed minutes and comments will be limited to a total of 20 minutes per topic. If there are multiple people wishing to comment, a staff member will facilitate the reading of online public comment submissions. Per board policy 9323, each speaker is limited to three minutes and 20 minutes per topic. For this meeting, however, we will increase the limit to 90 minutes total for the topic of in-person learning. I encourage you to limit your comments to one minute if possible, because with the number of online submissions we have, we are going to be here at least three hours just for that. Pursuant to section 54954.2 of the government code, no action of or discussion shall be undertaken on any item not appearing on the posted agenda. Um, for the comments that have been emailed, for brevity, I have authorized Mrs. Worley, who will be reading them, to give a uh, edited synopsis using the introduction statement and the uh, last paragraph. However, for the in-person request to speak, I will call you up in the order in which you submitted them. And um, let's get started with that. Oh. For um, any comments that have not been read tonight, they are going to be available to all board members. And if any community members would like to read them as well, they will be available by request here at the district office. So our first speaker will be Timothy, followed by Sonia, followed by Megan, please. And you'll see your timer on each wall. No. And please, uh, let's see, state your name. Timothy. And a little closer, a louder, please. Sympathy. Thank you. It's my understanding that uh, throughout the news media, alternative and mainstream, teachers, unions, school boards have been Caught several times 
talking trash about all of the parents wanting to bring their kids back to school. No secret that the teachers union is a, a political organization. Okay. Uh, we want to return to normal, but your plan right now with uh, approximately 50 days of uh, instructional time remaining this school year is a uh, subject to change and it's motivated by money. You uh, want your money from uh, Sacramento. And so you're shoving this plan, which is subject to change, down our throat. You altered our lives. This, this school board, this district, this county, this state have destroyed our children's education for the past 12 months. It went from being substandard in the class to below that at home on Zoom. Now you want to reduce that education uh, time of instruction even further by playing musical chairs in musical schools, having us shuttle our kids back and forth. Which day do we have school? Which day do we have Zoom? Uh, in addition to that, I have firsthand knowledge that you already have changed this plan. You've already said, oh, we've made some changes. But in addition, the high school level, you're not even providing instruction at the high school. You're making the students sit in an advisory class for 90 minutes to do nothing and then go home. There's no instruction, there's no lesson planning being provided to any of those high school students and then they're going to go home. All in the name of how Mr. Elliott noted very well earlier. He's saying, Begging Riverside County Health to close this school, so we should have been begging them to keep them open. And you couldn't do so without losing money. This whole bid to show this plan is subject to change is in the name of money. That's no. You can easily just put it back to a normal school schedule in August and save the charade this plan and use the care for your, your school money from Sacramento. Thank you, sir. Sonia? Did you offer me a question? Did you offer anything to happen as a one of the kids? It is time to open up the school and get our children back to learn. It is time to return to normalcy. For a whole year, we've been told to follow the science. The science says it is safe for our kids to return to school. Speak into the mic, please. I search for options and I am a struggling, I can't afford it. Trying to find a private school for my eighth grader. I feel like I would take any dollar amount to not let her fall behind. Unfortunately, I can only find a private school that comes to sixth grade. You all have said something is wrong here. With the governor, you guys should have all said something is wrong here when the governor himself was giving kids to school. I reached out to the school board. And I reached out to our elected representative and typical, I was ignored those who promised to, by those who promised to represent me. It wasn't until recently when many became a motivator that California started talking about opening schools. How was opening other schools? But I do want to point out, sorry, Robert Garcia, God bless you, because you want to take my call and you heard my daughter having a mental breakdown. I let you listen to her crying 
and have a mental breakdown. She needs to be back in school. I'm running out of time, but I do want to point out something real quick. I said the number five. That's the number of times that little monitor was passed around and you guys all touched it. That's not social distancing. You did your speech without wearing your mask. If you guys can't follow the rules, how the hell do you expect our kids to do? I would like to add on to our next uh, future agenda, money transfer. If you guys can't get my kids to school, I want the dollars that you guys can pay for the money Um, who's, who's in charge of that sound? Can you, yeah, that's, that's frightening. I don't like that. I've been hauled off in an ambulance. I don't like that. Can we ensure that everybody's speaking to that microphone? We're having a really hard time hearing you. Can you hear me? No, I can hear you. No, it's speaking into the microphone. So, okay. You okay. can hear me now. Okay. And after after Megan will be Amy and Leslie, please. Okay. Please go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, trustees and school personnel. Oh, my name is Megan Price Ludarchik. Um, good evening, trustees and school personnel. I stand before you as a mother, a community member, and a fellow teacher from a neighboring school district. I'm speaking tonight in favor of giving parents the choice to send their students back to school in person so they do not continue to fall further and further behind. Beginning next week, our students will have been for a year. Hold on a second. Josh, I think that microphone is turning off automatically. Test, test. Okay, I'll just hold it. You're, just you're, it you're good. You're good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, beginning next week, our students will have spent over a year outside. Did we pause her time? Susan, while, while we're resetting, would you please read some of the uh, write-in? Thank you. I'll begin with Wendy Eccles. Okay, make sure it's only three minutes, please. NEAJ president. Um, it's a very long one, so I'm just gonna kind of give a synopsis of it. Um, essentially, they did do a survey for their certificated staff. Um, she asked them to compile lists of concerns. The results will speak volumes. There were 667 of our members that responded to a survey, 70% of the certificated bargaining unit. These are just some of the questions we asked followed by responses. Do you believe that JUSD should return to in-person for the remainder of the school year? 30% yes, 70% no. On a scale of one to five, how comfortable are you with the prospect of a return to on-campus at some point during the school year? One very, five not at all. The average response was a four. Do you feel prepared to return to in-person hybrid combination of in-person virtual learning? 21.5% said yes, 78.5% said no. If given the choice, would you prefer to remain in distance learning for the rest of the 2021 school year? or return to a hybrid model. 74% chose distance learning, 26% hybrid model. Which type of hybrid schedule would you prefer? 50% alternating stable groups, 30% AM PM stable groups, 13% simultaneous, in-person or virtual. What are your top three safety concerns? One, physical distancing and class size. Two, classroom ventilation and three, cleaning, disinfecting, and sanitizing. There are additional questions and responses that will be sent to you. I do not envy the choice you have before you, but I ask that you consider the overwhelming sentiment of our educators and continue to ask the difficult questions. Thank you, for, thank, thank you to all of you, and please continue to stay safe and well. Want me to continue? Uh, are you ready, Mr. Lewis? No, please continue, Mrs. Okay. Worley. Okay. So essentially in our online comments, parents and anybody who, who responded were given a choice to select if they wanted to continue virtually, return to in-person hybrid, 
or have an other neutral opinion. The first response, response wants to do virtual only. Um, the county remains in the purple tier for wide, widespread transmission. The number of school age children with COVID-19 has been increasing. Children and adolescents can be affected with the virus that causes COVID and can get sick with COVID. They can spread the virus to others. They ask that we consider the fact that teachers are already overwhelmed and in short supply, making offering two instruction models a logistical nightmare. With the year quickly coming to a close, it makes no sense to upend student routines by rushing a return to in-person instruction. I implore that the board instead consider finishing the year online and using the remaining time to focus on providing the best possible summer and fall instruction possible. Another comment does not have an opinion either way, just they would like, just wants to know the options on how it's going to look. This is from a teacher in the district that teaches kindergarten and shares a classroom. She has her concerns about what will be done as far as how that's going to look for sharing a classroom, recess, will the playground be able to be used, not used? How are we going to have five-year-olds get their energy out? Um, restrooms are a concern with half-day kindergarten students. How will they be cleaned? Will restrooms be closed? Will students be expected to take Chromebooks back and forth? Um, she has addressed the board numerous times and also basically is just reiterating her information. That's from Jessica Schmidt. Okay, thank you. Are you ready? We're ready to resume this more dark trick. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. perfectly. Thank Great. you so much. Okay, so I will start again from the top. Good evening, trustees and school personnel. I stand before you as a mother, a community member, and a fellow teacher from a neighboring district. I'm speaking tonight in favor of giving parents the choice to send their students back to school in person so they, um, so they do not continue to fall further and further behind. Beginning next week, our students will have spent over a year outside the classroom when students in states such as South Carolina, Virginia, Florida, Arizona, among others, have been in the classroom since August. Students in our very own state, less than 20 miles down the road in neighboring districts in neighboring private schools have returned to the classroom. Private schools have adopted protocols allowing students in the classroom five days a week with full school days since September. They wear their masks, they wash their hands, and they have properly managed the risk. Now is the time to allow JUSD students to return to the classroom. COVID infection rates are plummeting, kids are failing their courses, families are struggling, our kids are struggling. State leaders are pushing for a return. The di district has had a year to prepare for this moment. They have had access to countless resources and funds, including the CARES Act, and now incentives allocated by Governor Newsom. Every day you wait to open our schools, you take more funding away that would help educate our students and to do so safely. It has been proven and continues to be proven that returning to school is achievable and sustainable. As I mentioned before, I teach in a neighboring district and we have set a return date for our students and teachers that is just a few short weeks ago away. I teach high school. For about a month now, I have been part of a cohort of teachers and students that have been testing how to teach in a hybrid model. Has it required me to think outside the box? Yes. Has it required me to change the way I teach again? Yes. Is it a challenge? Yes. But I know that in-person education is the best place for my students to learn. My students have been a part of the process every single step of the way. My students who are attending in person and in line, online have provided feedback about what is working, what is not, and what needs to be revised. They have offered suggestions on how to make things better for everyone. If we can ask our students to learn new things and be flexible, then as educators, we can do the same. We can work together to begin to return to normalcy. I would hope you will do what is right and allow for families that can safely return to the classroom to have the choice to return so their students can get the education they deserve. Thank you and good evening. Thank you. Next is Leslie. 
your card says DSA parent. What does that mean? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Leslie and I have three students that are all in elementary. So you can imagine how it is in a home where there's not enough room for everybody. Excuse me, can you please get closer? I am very hard of hearing, so I need you talking into the microphone. Okay, please. sorry about Thank that. Thank you. Um, I have three students at home. I have a dual immersion kindergartner who doesn't know Spanish, who's supposed to be immersed into the language that hasn't been immersed. I have a fourth grader that was engaged, that was doing excellent before the pandemic and now is struggling to do well. And then I have a sixth grader who's going to be going to um, junior high next year. And I have these three students at home with my mom that doesn't speak English trying to help them and does not have the capacity or doesn't know how to use any of the electronics. So she's constantly calling me at work where my husband and I are both full-time work and we're not home with them to be able to help them with, mm, with the technology and everything else that they need. So it's been a year of this. So they're the impact i don't i don't think you can see the impact that these children are that this is having on their education and on their social skills you know um i've i've had i'm i'm sorry i'm just flustered i have um co-workers whose children go to private school ontario christian hasn't closed loma linda academy hasn't closed linto christian and temecula hasn't closed and they're there from the morning until they have a full day, five days a week. I just don't understand why we can't look at the way that they're doing it and mimic it or, or copy it to, to what our children are doing. And that's it. Thank you. Next is Leslie followed by Celia. Oh, sorry. Okay, so I'm Amy Tompkins. I don't know if that's what the chief says. Thank you. Okay. Um, so please understand the tone of what I have to say will be painfully honest, raw, emotional, and may even at times sound condescending and insulting, and that I apologize. But it will be honest and coming from a concerned parent that is sick and tired of hearing that the biggest concern as to why school cannot open in our district um, in-person instruction for the safety of the children and their families when in fact the number one safety is your teachers your staff and their families quite honestly so allow me to ask this question is my help not any less important than your teachers I have to physically report to a job to earn a paycheck and stay employed but maybe you feel that I'm not as vulnerable because I'm not working around children okay then are the lives of the teachers working for JUSD more important than the lives of teachers working in any other district California or elsewhere Short story, I'd like to share that I have a niece and nephew, first and fourth grader in Tampa, Florida, the very city that just successfully hosted the Super Bowl with 74,000 spectators in the stadium and another 30,000 in their parking lot. Where's the uptick in cases? None. They have been attending this local elementary school since August, the beginning of the school year in Hillsborough County School District. This district started the school year in August. They did one week of virtual for everybody, so everybody understood what virtual looked like just in case they'd have to resort back to it. Then they allowed the students that wanted to return in person to do so, and every student that chose not to, to do so by distance learning, by simulcast that did work and is working. These students tuned into the classroom via Zoom. They listened to the same instruction by the same teacher they were assigned. The students that required transportation, the buses are operating. Every student wears a mask in class and on that bus. They eat inside the school cafeteria because you will melt in Tampa, Florida if you're outside. The school district has 250 schools and 205,000 students. We are a tenth their size. If this school district that size can manage to do both, so can we. I would like to give credit where credit is due. I'm not here to offer any criticism about my children's teachers. I'm extremely happy with their teachers, and so are my kids. And because of that, I want my children to meet and know these special teachers that they're working with a pandemic with. They were assigned a third and fifth grade in their school year. That teacher that went above and beyond and had to work 10 times harder at a lesson plan teaching her students in a fast that had never been done before, or at least not to that small little group of people. That teacher was willing to be so open and available to her student and their parents that it became normal to text any concerns no matter what time of the day, constantly. Hey, 
so and so's not online. Hey, I'm immediately calling home, getting them back online. I commend those teachers for the impossible task that they were given, and I thank you for your commitment. I'm here to advocate for the families that need the in-person instruction option to be actually an option. I'm not here to take away the distance learning option. I'm here to do it so that you go back to school, everybody, the five days a week, and let the numbers speak for themselves. If they get sick, then yank us all back out again. But let it prove it. Because again, if we don't go back- I'm sorry, your time months, is up. If we don't go back in two months, then it'll be five more months they're out of school. Good evening. To not reiterate what everybody else has said, I had to tweak my speech a little bit. I am a first responder. I have seen the devastation that this has caused upon the community that I service. From the children having to be taken care at home, to tech issues with their equipment, stress upon the marriages, medical calls for mental breakdowns, suicide and unforeseen deaths due to COVID. I've seen that along with my coworkers, the fire department and medical staff. Throughout this past year, we have learned, we had to learn how to live through COVID. Implement safety that kept us healthy because we still had to come home to our children and our family. During this time, the department has had me test every two weeks to ensure the public safety um, and my safety as well. As we know, adults run the risk of having a more severe symptom than children do, which is tested through your slides. With that said, my coworkers and I still went to work to fulfill our responsibilities and the commitment that we have to our community. We did not stay home. We did not lock our doors and we did not hide from this illness. We learned how to work through it. Needless to say, some of us did get infected, some more severe than others, but we still returned to work shortly after to continue to fulfill our commitment. Once I clock off, I'm a mother just like anybody else. I complied with the school. I made all the accommodations that were necessary for, so my children could learn from home. I got childcare full time. I purchased desks, supplies, and made it as safe and as quiet so my children could learn to the best of their ability with distance learning. When I got home, I did my best to help them complete their homework. More often than not, I was online trying to figure out what needed to get done. I'm not a teacher. I don't have the credentials and distance learning can only do so much. The time has come. It's been a year. My children need to return to school. They are being shortchanged from an academic growth. I have fulfilled my commitment to the community and to my responsibilities to keep our communities safe. I now ask the school board to give our teachers the opportunity to return to school so they could fulfill their responsibilities and their commitment so our children grow academically. As you guys have stated, they run the risk of being minimal, minimally um, infected with COVID-19, and now the staff has the opportunity to take the vaccination. I, I don't agree with going to school part-time. You're only hindering my schedule a lot more. Where am I gonna get a ride? Who's gonna take my children? What session are they gonna go to? And there's no way my children are gonna walk to school. I'm a first responder. I know what happens to children that walk. Your time is expired. Thank you. Have we concluded everyone? You filled out a speaker's card. Okay, Mrs. Worley. Did Celia speak? Okay. Okay, um, Mrs. Worley, would you read for a minute? And, and uh, if there's a coherent sentence, please read that as a summary. Okay. Um, the Use your good judgment. The next comment is opposed to reopening schools. It would be disruptive to change the schedule at this point in the, re in the year. Returning now would interfere with valuable instruction, instructional time 
to be replaced with learning routines, procedures, as well as new safety protocols. It is recommended that we wait until the fall to open for in-person, allow teachers, staff, and community members time to get vaccinated. I pray that each one of you has the courage to vote according to your personal convictions of what is right rather than being persuaded by political pressure yes. or monetary benefits. Would you include names too, please? If they're there, many are oh, just okay. not there. Thank you. Um, this one is from Angela Vila that I just read. The next comment is in favor of reopening schools. A proud parent, Jennifer Lamas, as two very smart and energetic kindergartners, they are new to Harupa and encourage us to please reopen our schools. Their learning excitement and eagerness to participate in class has now ceased. The learning has stopped. We're failing our children and cannot continue. Virtual learning is simply ineffective and non-ideal for young children. JUSD has had a year to prepare. Please use this opportunity to demonstrate your district's ability to adapt and overcome. I hope that the board will come to the right decision and choose to safely welcome our children back. Mrs. Worley, are, are, would you make sure I know when you go to a, a new comment? Okay, are, are we trying to time them? Um, not necessarily, but if, you, if you'd tell me when, when you go to new ones, okay. Mr. Lewis could. Okay, new comment in favor of virtual learning. It is impossible to fully up to fully and appropriately address, implement, and sustain a safe and comprehensive reopening plan for all sites within just a few weeks' time. Parents should parents would have to create another modified child care schedule and new transportation routines for their children. That is no easy task. Students would be starting over. Teachers will have to develop new instructional routines that work with the safety and physical distancing protocols. Instruction can only begin once students have a sense of understanding how their new learning environment is supposed to operate. This will be no small task. School staff would have to adapt their duties and routines to support the presence of students on campus. No small task. In short, to return to in-person instruction during the short remainder of the year poses a significant health risk and a disruption to everyone's schedule. To assume that a safety plan can be properly developed and meticulously implemented at each school site in a matter of weeks is ludicrous. Moving on to the next comment in favor of reopening a parent at Van Buren Elementary. I have now seen how being home, being home away from school has affected my seven year old mentally where she cries herself to sleep since she misses school so much. She's been counting the days to March 8th, hoping she will get the news that her school will reopen. Please think about the mental well-being of our children and allow those parents that choose to send their children back. The kids need this. Next comment in favor of virtual, a current teacher of 15 years. My husband has pre-existing conditions that would likely cause life-threatening complications should he contract COVID. He is not eligible for the vaccine under any current program, so I cannot risk him being exposed to the virus. If schools return to in-person instruction, I was given a choice. I would likely choose to teach from home in order to minimize his risk, and my children would have to continue distance learning anyway. Next comment in favor of reopening, a district teacher and mother to children that attend the district believes our schools should reopen. I strongly feel that we should open the schools for hybrid learning, give the teachers some credit for how tirelessly they have and continue to work. If the board votes in favor of reopening, my only concern is the safety and well-being of all staff and members. I look forward to seeing the plans in place for reopening. Next comment against reopening. Does the board realize that upon returning to school for in-person instruction, that students will be subjected to weeks of standardized testing instead of actual instruction? Is the board and district prepared to close campuses in the event we have a surge in the virus? Is it fair for students to subject, is it fair to, sorry, is it fair to students to subject them to another drastic change in routine in addition to exposing them to an environment 
where they may contract a virus that has the potential to be deadly. Next comment in favor of reopening. Science is telling us that it is safe to reopen. Now science is telling us safety protocols and PPE help protect one from getting COVID. Science has created vaccines to protect against COVID. Some might argue it's too disruptive to start in person this late. I would counter that our kids for the last year have only known a disruptive schedule. Disruptive when schools were closed, disruptive when technical issues arise with distance learning, disruptive when there were numerous power outages and couldn't log into school. I'm a working mom and if my kids only went to school for one day or half a day, I would find it worth it to juggle my schedule because our students need hope and motivation more than ever that they will return to school in person. Next comment against, thank you for taking the time to listen. So now suddenly just open the floodgates with only about 40-ish school days left by the time we could open according to the state incentive guidelines seems imprudent. We have new variants emerging with unknown effects, even to children. I am now fortunately fully vaccinated and for that I am beyond grateful. However, my husband falls into a different eligibility tier regardless of his existing health risk and he is not yet eligible. Questions in regards to funding, what will the money be used towards? I believe that learning time will actually be lost with a rush to return to school. We have established routines and connections with our classes. We have created new learning communities that none of us could have ever imagined before. Returning to the classroom and what would have to be a split group to accommodate distancing would divide my class into at least half. Again, on very short notice, she has child care concerns. I don't consider my employer to be responsible for my child care needs normally, but normally we have an established calendar and schedule and parents can plan accordingly. Moving on, in support of reopening, parents who want their children to return should be allowed that option, especially for the younger grades, since cases have reached that threshold, other districts in California and Riverside County have done so, therefore we should also. Students need in-person social emotional support when will suicides and depression be part of the conversation? Also, students in the dual immersion program at the elementary level should be considered a special co cohort needing special support. They are acquiring a second language and are losing valuable instruction in virtual setting. Next comment against. A summary is it's a fear of bringing it home to parents and grandparents that all live together and cannot be vaccinated due to allergies. Next comment in favor of reopening is a high school student struggling to get a grasp of knowledge and understanding of lessons through the computer. Most of us are not paying attention and not finding the encouragement to continue with online classes. Students need the interaction in the classroom to fully succeed in a learning course. Schools should reopen. We are struggling and this is in this setting, especially the AP students. Next comment in favor of virtual. This is an elementary resource specialist for the district concerned about going back to in person this year because I do not see what we are adequately prepared for as far as students coming back to campus. I have not been informed of how I will be expected to serve my students according to their emergency condition provision plan or their IEP. There are countless unanswered questions and I do not think these questions will be answered by April 1st. Our district has been careful up to now and it does not seem feasible to try to get prepared to return by April 1st. The teachers have neither seen nor heard of a reopening plan. We have nine more days till spring break and then tenants will return the following week. This is definitely not an adequate time frame to get prepared and return the lessons we all have worked tirelessly to prepare this year. Next comment in favor of virtual. Current teacher in JUSD 
and parent of a child in RUSD. I find it absolutely unacceptable and irresponsible of the district to not have, well, interesting, a back to school plan and shared with staff and parents before now. There are just so many unanswered questions. We deserve to have answers and the courtesy of knowing what we are going to be facing before being thrown into a situation. As a longtime employee of the district, I have never felt so undervalued, disheartened as I do at this moment. Another one in favor of staying virtual. Going back now would mean starting all over again to regain classroom normalcy and setting expectations in a completely new and complex classroom environment. I am against going back for now. Next comment in favor of reopening, a Del Sol parent. Their school can be used for parents who want to pay for their children to attend a private program is unfair to all of us who already pay high taxes in this new community. How is it okay for them to be there and not our children? My second grade daughter is no longer learning. I hope you will consider reopening. Next comment in favor of virtual only is a father in the district. The disruption to my child care arrangement would be impossible to manage. And on top of all of this, we're dealing with COVID out in the public. I have a compromise, some family members have a compromised immune system. It would be safer to remain in distance learning. Next comment is in favor of reopening. This is apparent. The COVID environment has brought about many challenges and the primary challenge for us has been schooling for our daughter. While the staff at the district office and school have been excellent during this time, we can see the challenges for them as well. But the time has come for all of us to focus on the challenge of returning students to in-person instruction. It is my hope that tonight you will set the district on the path to return to in-person instruction after the spring break. Allow our children some normalcy, something that has been lacking for all of us for nearly a year. In favor, children need to return. In favor, I would like to express my support for in-person hybrid sessions for the remainder of the school year. It is my strong opinion that going back to class, even for a fraction of the day, can greatly improve our children's learning. As you make your decision, I hope you will keep only one thing in mind. That is what is best interest of our students in JUSD. The CDC, the governor, the state legislator, legislature, the American Academy for Pediatrics, and now the CTA all agree that it is in the best interest of the children to return to school. Next comment in favor of um, everybody will be asking why bother since it's so late in the year. The reason is that we need to start somewhere. A hybrid model will be a good transition to ease our students back into the classrooms for the next few weeks. The district can use this time as a trial and error to see what is working and what is not to begin the next school year. Next comment against reopening. I do not agree with the reopening plan. The district has had a year to prepare for the return, albeit with no steadfast guidelines, but this was inevitable. Supplies should have been ordered and a preliminary contingency plan in place when Governor Newsom had lifted the stay at home order. Next comment, no comment, just a vote for going back to in-person. The next one is for virtual learning only. Virtual has just been awful with confusing and often conflict, conflicting directions coming from teachers, staff, and district. However, to remove the students from what they've finally become accustomed to and once again force a significant change in their life for a couple more months of school would do more harm than good. Next comment in favor of reopening. Now that the state is saying that it's safe to do so, I don't know why there already hasn't been a place and plan to open when school districts around us were prepared. We as parents deserve to make the choice for our children. We know our kids will need the option to return to school. Specifically, my child needs the social interaction and learning in person and hands-on teaching. 
Next comment is against reopening parents in the community. The entire situation of considering going back is not what is in the best interest of anyone, but the people getting paid to do it. This is all about money and incentive to you, not a mandate. This is an incentive motiv motivated behind money. If this was about health, we would remain closed. The district saying they're offering in-person learning is a lie. There is no in-person instruction offered in advisory homework. Working parents cannot bring their high school students to campus just to turn around and pick them up 90 minutes later. The district isn't even offering transportation services and yet, but drivers are still getting paid. If you really wanted to offer in-person learning, have real classes, a rotating schedule, but we all know that cannot happen. I'm writing as a concerned member of Harupa Valley, asking the board to reconsider reopening primary schools for the 2021 school year for the health and safety. Next comment, opposing reopening. Thanks the district. Opening the school soon can cause problems for the community. Would it be worth it to change online learning for a possibility of two months of in-person or hybrid teaching? There would be 45 school days after the spring break. That's 25% of the school year. If tried to reopen in the spring, we must inspect how the school days will be used during these two months. Taking all of that into consideration, we're trying to open the schools for about 15 to 17% of the school year in person and hybrid. Let us not forget that currently the elementary class schedule doesn't reflect the full day. Trying to open the school for 15% of the school year would when students can still spread COVID to the people that aren't fully vaccinated. Next comment is for reopening. It is well known that neighboring school districts as well are returning to in-person teaching in some type of capacity. As for parents in this school district, it is very uncanny as to why our school district is not included in the upcoming student return to school action. Please explain as much detail what the district has done towards school reentry. A vote for keeping schools virtual, wait until next year favor of reopening school should open full time the same way it has always been next comment against reopening as a parent teacher within the district i'm asking you to vote to keep virtual learning for the remainder of the year it is far too much to ask parents students and teachers once again to change their routine and structure that they have set in place since august the amount of stress and worry that comes from having to once again worry about the what ifs and how is just too much. This year has been hard enough. Please consider the negative impact that another change this late in the year would have to families. Next comment, opposed to reopening. Please consider keeping the rest of the school year virtual. Utilize the summer break to prepare for the next school year. Next comment opposed, writing as a concerned community member, I'm asking the board delay the reopening plan for primary schools this academic year. It is very concerning that the reopening plan is just now being presented and expected to be implemented, implemented in two to three weeks. Next comment is against reopening. The school year is almost done. Let's wait till August. Next comment is against, please continue virtual, no reopening just yet. There's a vote here, yes, please reopen. Next comment, I'm in favor of students and faculty returning to the school site full time. Families who wish to opt out should have an online school available to them. These programs were in place before the coronavirus. Staff who do not wish to return to the site are welcome to retire or seek other employment. Vaccines have been available to them already. Studies show that children are not likely to suffer from COVID, nor are they likely to transmit to an adult. Accommodations should be made for students with underlying conditions or who are at high risk. Next comment in favor of reopening. 
Schools need to reopen full time back to normal. Any other method would bankrupt families since working parents cannot pick up in a hybrid school schedule. JUSD children are at a disadvantage because they're considered to be in the lower side of the social, economic, and education when compared to East Bell, and they have already reopened. Many parents do not have the knowledge, skills, or time to assess their children. Next comment is in favor. She addressed the board back in October and thanked the, the board for prioritizing the health and safety of staff and students, and she continues to be thankful for that. Um, I spend my days talking to an empty classroom that doesn't talk back assigning work that is increasingly not completed. I'm frustrated that my students face barriers to learning that we cannot address from the other side of a computer screen. I'm hearing from students that are working during school hours, working throughout the night and sleeping through class, helping younger siblings with their online school and most prevalent of all lacking motivation. I ask you today to make plans as soon as possible to allow for in-person instruction of any type as soon as possible for as many students as possible. Many students are not yet prepared to return to campus and should be allowed to continue online. However, those families that are prepared should be able to do so. Next comment in favor of Camino Real parents. Thank you to all of JUSD teachers who are willing to take the more difficult path of teaching hybrid and possibly virtual, as well as knowing that in-person instruction is what is best and what is needed for some children. I've watched my children hit a slump. I've watched them both fail to live up to their potential, despite all of our best efforts and attention. This is learning with limits. You have said from the start, student safety is your priority and that you rely on the science so I ask you now to trust the science that states that it is safe to reopen schools and vote to allow it to be an option. Focus the majority of your attention on ensuring that safety plans are clear and followed through. Hold the district accountable and represent our families. Next comment is against. Why is the money so important to the board? Is money all you care about? This legislation stipulates funding is in addition to the budget, not subtracting from the budget. We have family members of our students passing away, and now we want to expose students and thus families to a disease that has already taken so much from all of us. Has the district's financing been so mismanaged that you need this money? Keep everyone home and the funds are not needed. The district made the wise choice earlier in the year to play it cautious, be patient, and just wait. Why now? Would we disrupt schedules and the routines of students and families causing greater stress and disparagement on the people of the district that the district claims to care about? Next comment is in favor of reopening. The facts are in, COVID does not require JUSD to continue hybrid or virtual learning. JUSD staff may have the luxury to work from home but working parents do not. A few parents have started taking their kids to private school, but we cannot afford that. Please do your job and by teaching the kids in person, there is no other option. Next, there's just simply a vote for yes to continue virtual, two votes for yes to go back to in-person. Next comment is supporting virtual learning as a concerned resident with my family in JUSD, at this time, I believe reopening the schools is too soon and ask the board to consider the safety of our children, community, and families. Although we want to be back in the classroom, it is not worth it to put our safety at risk. Next comment is in favor. Kids need to return to school. They need the interaction with their peers. My daughter's in the third grade and has been getting depressed and having anxiety. She just wants to go back to school and have one-on-one -on -one time with her teacher. Please reopen school. The next comment is against reopening. At 6 p.m., there were over 400 people watching this meeting online. 
compare this number to the people in that room with you. That alone should tell you people are not ready for in-person opening. Play it safe. When people are ready to come out in person to a board meeting, to a social gathering, to school, then talk about reopening. Now is not that time. Next comment is in favor of virtual learning. This is a teacher and community member. The board was supportive of the staff, faculty, administration, students, and the community when they chose to close in March, continue to stay closed. I pray that the board continues to support our people both in and living outside of the community by staying closed until it is safe. Do not misconstrue my feelings about my career choice. I miss my students terribly. I can't explain how happy I am when they respond and verbally answer with good morning. Please do not let the money take precedence over the people. Next comment in favor of virtual learning. I feel we should wait until next school year. My daughter is very excited thinking she can go back to school soon but she is also prone to pneumonia and it worries me to send her back. I realize that everyone is eager to return, but let's give it time to take effective steps properly and not rush it. Next comment is in favor of reopening. I accept reopening, but only full day. I cannot afford three hours. We are parents and work full time. Next comment is in favor of continuing virtually. Classified staff member with the district and a lifelong resident of Harupa. Um, lost learning opportunities and support for students is a concern for all of us. But is it safe to reopen when the risk of their health and school staff health? The distance learning model is not ideal. We know it is not perfect. Many of us want to be back in the classroom. And that is the long-term goal, but only when it is safe to do so. We understand parents are exhausted and burnt out. Many families are struggling in different ways. The strain mentally, emotionally, and financially has affected all of us. We have our own families and children, our own health concerns, and vulnerable at-risk family members. Next comment is in favor. I would like for my children to go back to in-person school. Next comment is in favor of virtual learning. Parents at Peralta Elementary. They are learning so much online while being kept home and safe. We would love for our children to be able to remain at home until everyone in our home gets the vaccine. We feel it is just not safe to be at school yet. I'm also very concerned about my second grader's teacher, Mrs. Webb, going back to the classroom before her husband gets the vaccine, as he has not been able to receive it yet. I'm sure there are more teachers and staff with similar concerns. Moving on to the next comment, it is in favor of reopening. Why can't kids and teachers go back to full-time in person? Science says the people are being hurt the most are the mothers who have had to leave the workforce to homeschool their students while still paying teachers and students who are being left behind educationally, socially, and mentally. Next comment is in favor of distance learning. This plan, they are not taking into account that even the students are not so likely to be infected, but the family at home. Next comment in favor of reopening. What about the teachers that do not have childcare because of the current situation? Can our children be on campus with us and do their virtual work in our classrooms? Next comment is in favor of distance learning. As a mother, I'm concerned about the health of my children. My nephew, age five, got very sick and I do not want to put my children who are older at risk. I am very concerned. The next comments voted for other. Um, I would like to make a clarifying point regarding the presentation. A comment was made by Mr. Brooks that the EAP program offers staff assistance with their mental wellness. 
the EAP program offers staff 10 visits per year total, no more than that. After 10 visits have been exhausted, staff is expected to pay out of pocket. If a teacher is seeing a therapist weekly, they are to pay out of cost expenses that can be $100 or more per visit. The next comment in favor of reopening, will think together be offered after school since the plan shows students leaving campus at 11, continuing virtual at 1230. This will be a great help for all working parents who cannot leave from work to pick up the students on those days. The next comment, is not in favor of either, they're neutral. Staff has been required to close and lock all classroom doors on campus for protection from active shooters. How is the district justifying ventilation with classroom doors ajar while there is still possible threat of active shooters? Next comment is also not in favor of either. While your graphics and presentation for the elementary schedule was very expensive and although confusing, loaded with information. I am disturbed that the, presentation, that the presentation glossed over the secondary schedule with little or no information and not, I'm not even sure if a graphic was shown because it went so quickly. Are you hiding something or did someone just forget to give the secondary schedule as much credit as the primary? Next comment is for continuing virtually. Do not proceed with reopening schools. I'm extremely worried about the health of my family. It will be compromised if you go forward with this plan. The next and final comment is in regards to remaining virtual. I am not in favor of reopening schools in March or for the remainder of the school year. I would prefer that our students return in the fall to allow more time for teachers to be vaccinated if they choose to or allow for the number of cases to go down. And once again, I will send all of these comments to the board members so that you can see them in their entirety. Thank you, Mrs. Morley. You okay. did. Sorry, I'm going to read um, Wendy Ethel and EAJ president's comments in its entirety. Okay. Okay, we are we are giving Mrs. Eccles an additional amount of time because she represents the association, which is a larger group of people. NEA Harupa. Okay. Um, good evening, Trustee Superintendent Dushan and Cabinet. My apologies for not being there in person. I have been strictly following all public health guidelines to protect myself and my family. Like many in JUSD, I look forward to getting the second COVID, COVID shot at the RHS clinic on Friday and being fully vaccinated. It seems surreal that it's been almost a year since the decision to close the schools to in-person instruction. I thank you now as I have all year for continuing to prioritize the health and safety of our staff and their families, our students and their families and the community at large. Throughout the pandemic, we have worked in a true collaborative partnership, and I know that will continue. As we all have been processing the continued uncertainty during these times, it's important to again note that our schools were never closed. Our members and our students continue to teach and learn in new and innovative ways, and that we are all trying our best each and every day. Last week, I sent you a compiled list of concerns and questions from our membership regarding the potential return to in-person instruction and sent the most recently updated document this afternoon. In addition, NEAJ Harupa 
surveyed our members to get an idea of where they stand on the return to in-person instruction, instruction and it's imperative to publicly share those results with you as you consider the plan to return to in-person instruction. With over 950 bargaining unit members, there are a wide variety of concerns and comfort levels. The results speak volumes as to where our unit members are right now. 667 of our members responded to the survey, 70% of the certificated bargaining unit. These are just some of the questions asked, followed by responses. Do you believe that JUSD should return to in-person learning for the remainder of the school year? 30% yes, 70% no. On a scale of one to five, how comfortable are you with the prospect of a return to on-campus at some point during the school year? One equals very, five not at all. The average response was four. Do you feel prepared to return to in-person hybrid combination of in-person virtual learning? 21.5% yes, 78.5% no. If given the choice, would you prefer to remain in distance learning for the rest of the 2021 school year or return to a hybrid model? 74% distance learning, 26% hybrid. Which type of hybrid schedule would you prefer? 57% alternating stable groups, 30% AM PM stable groups, 13% simultaneous in-person and virtual. What are your top three safety concerns? One, physical distancing and class size. Two, classroom ventilation. And three, cleaning, disinfecting, and sanitizing. There are additional questions and responses that will be sent to you. I do not envy the choice that you have before you, but I ask that you consider the overwhelming sentiment of our educators and continue to ask the difficult questions. Thank you to all of you, and please continue to stay safe and well. Thank you so much. I've been requested for a five minute health break. We will return in five minutes.
Thank you very much. We are returning to open session at 9.38 to agenda item five, administrative reports and written reports. Agenda item 5A, California Standards LCAP Implementation Report. Mr. Dubrovsky. Thank you. Um, as you know, there's there's a lot going on, and, and in addition to potential reopening plans, there's a lot of other stuff going on. So I just want to spend a few minutes updating you on some of the things happening. We're having a little trouble with the PowerPoint, so I'm just going to talk. Um, there, there are two, two areas I want to update you on. One, uh, end of year activities like graduation, the other summer school plans. Um, you already heard from our wonderful student board members that, are, that uh, schools are in the process of planning a potential in-person graduation. Um, we're, we're hopeful and believe that we'll be able to offer a socially distanced outdoor graduation with a limited audience. So we are proceeding with those plans um, in hopes of the idea that we will get the permission and be able to do so. We do have a backup plan for a drive-by, drive-through graduation that, you know, in case we absolutely have to do that, but we, we have high hopes that we're going to be able to do um, what we're planning, which is to offer our parents a, a limited, in-person, safe, socially distanced graduation. And additionally, a senior awards night, much the same. So we will continue forward with those plans and update you as things go by. Um, I'm thinking if Disneyland can open up, we can we can help our kids celebrate their graduation. So we're, we're hopeful that that will happen. Um, with regards to summer school, like I'm excited to announce what we're doing and planning for this summer. Essentially, we're planning the, the biggest round of multiple summer schools that I've seen in the 28 years I've been in the district. So, um, oh, yay, there we go. Okay. All right. So there are four summer school versions that we are planning for this summer. And you'll see some of them are contingent on being able to offer it in person. Others will be a combination of virtual and in person. So there is our high school summer school, which we have done every year. There is the extended school year for our students with disability, so which we've also done every year. There is the Think Together summer program for our K-8 students. And then something that we haven't done for many years is offer a summer school program for our K-8 students, which we're calling our LEAP program, which stands for Learning Engages All Possibilities. So I'll take you through a little uh, quickly through each one. I know it's late, so I'll go fast. High school summer school will occur from June 1st to July 2nd. It will be two semesters as it always is. Um, it will be from 7.30 a.m. to 12.45. It will be significantly expanded, three times the amount of sections we plan to offer, provided we're able to staff that. Um, as an example, typically we would offer 14 year-long sections at both Rupa Valley and Rubido and 17 at Patriot. So this year we plan to offer 42 year long sections at uh, Rubido and Hoopa Valley and 51 sections at Patriot. So it will allow schools to serve expanded grade levels and really provide you know, a, a dent in catching up for some of those uh, credit needs that students will have because of, because of all the things that have happened in the last year um, and also get a head start for some students and get you know, our incoming ninth graders and orientation into high school life so there, there, are, there are an exciting bunch of things that we can do for our students. That will be offered both in person and virtual. We've always kind of done a little bit of a, a little bit of both. We've had an, like an, an online component and an in-person traditional instruction component. So, um, and in addition for our students that are seniors who don't quite graduate but are within 25 credits of graduation, we will offer our summer graduation program for any student that, um, that might need that so that we can get them finished up in early in the summer and have them be a part of our summer school graduation. So we are excited about high school summer school. Next, our, our extended school year, which is for our students with disabilities, that will be offered TK-12. Um, it, will, it will mirror the program, the gen ed look programs that are at that grade level. For example, the high school extended school year program will mirror the high school summer school, although it will run a little bit longer because it's mandated to be uh, a, a few more days than, than our high school program. The TK-8 will run at the same time as our LEAP program that I'll describe for you in just a moment. So our students will have choices. 
they, our students with disabilities will have the choice to engage in the extended school year program for our students with disabilities or just enroll in, in be in our uh, LEAP program or our regular high school summer program. And our TK8 students with disabilities will also have the opportunity to enroll in our Think Together program. The Think Together program, which, which is offered for students in grades one through eight, is a six hour program It'll be focused on language arts and math with other engaging sort of elective-like activities that students will engage in. Um, and we were fortunate that we were, the state gave us permission to expend those funds later than typical, which is usually it has to be done by June 30th. So it would have to compete with the other summer school programs, but they gave us flexibility so we can offer that program in July. So students could attend theoretically the LEAP program or the ESY program in the month of June and then also attend the thing together in the month of July. So getting educational opportunity essentially all summer long. Um, that is an in-person program. So it's contingent on us being able to offer in-person. And, and lastly is our LEAP program, which is for our K-8 students. It will run from June 7th to July 8th. It will be a four hour program. There'll be a series of focus areas. Um, you know, we talked about those SEL competencies. Those will be very important for our students as they re-engage. It'll be a lot of activities in terms of rebuilding school culture and getting kids used to the idea of being in class, engaging them in fun activities and also offering academic support. So um, we, we have already begun the recruiting process for teachers and we expect to be able to serve several thousand students. So. Um, so all told with all of those programs, we're gonna have a really robust summer series of offerings for our families to choose from if they would like to be involved in school during the summer. And all of them with an eye towards being engaging and interesting and enjoyable for kids. And yet at the same time, helping to build those, some of those academic competencies that may have slipped a little bit during the last, during the last year. So that's it for LCAP, unless there are any questions. Thanks for the presentation. Is what is the capacity going to be within the, the campuses? And I know that the, if we're looking at small cohorts during April and May to so June and July, what what are we going to allow? Well, what we're looking at, like for example, the LEAP program, we we have advertised to teachers, and we're hearing from them, and we've got many of them who are interested in participating, and and basically we'll look at. Um, how many schools do we utilize will depend on how many teachers we have set up for the program. It will, you know, because we need to have that socially distanced classroom and we expect to need that in the summer, you know, we'll, we'll probably have a capacity of around 15 in each class total um, so that we can maintain social distancing throughout. So, you know, we'll take the number of teachers, we'll take the, which will be the number of classes we offer, we'll determine you know, how many campuses we will utilize, whether it's eight campuses, all campuses, will just depend on the number of, of, of teachers that we have signed up and, and that we're able to offer. Same thing at the high school, you know, we, we um, at the high school, even with 42 classes, that's, we have way more than 42 class rooms at each high school. So we're able to, um, you know, keep those numbers the same, socially distanced and appropriate and yet still make it work. Okay, I appreciate that. That we're we're going to all um, outreach here and make sure that our our students have the opportunity. Um, we have received, or I have received, some emails of concerns of the the plan for the summer school. Would it be possible? I I don't know how in depth it's reached to the teachers, but make sure that there's crystal clear plans for our staff to understand what it is. I don't know if things have changed, but I know a couple of weeks ago emails are coming through with concerns of not understanding the summer program. So if they they could just something crystal clear so that we can ensure that our staff is when they're signing up, they know exactly what they're signing up for. Absolutely. Thank and we, you. You know, we sent out a little teaser to our staff just to see who potentially would be interested because we wanted to get a sense of how many students we might be able to offer for, but the actual hiring process is set to begin now. Um, that was, that was simply, we said we had a little video and we, um, you know, we gave them a little teaser about, about what we were thinking about during, for the, for the way the, the program would run and then we asked people to see is this something you think you'd like to be a part of um, so those more specific details will be coming soon but that was it was just intended to give them a just a tiny little overview and see you know we really didn't know how many teachers might be willing to work during the summer how many teachers really feel like 
this has been a tough year and I need to take a summer off. So we, we've actually been pretty excited by the response that we've got. Any other questions? All right. Do we have any other administrative reports or written communications? No. All right, let's move into the action session. In that case, agenda item A, to approve and adopt routine action items by consent. The administration recommends the board approve, adopt routine action items A, one through 20 as printed. Regarding agenda item A, approve, adopt routine action items by consent. Is there a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second. All right, there is a motion by Trustee Regal, a second by Trustee Garcia. Is there any discussion? And I believe our students are long gone, aren't they? All right, doing their homework or sleeping us. I approve. All right. In that case, would you please refresh your iPad and call for the vote, please. Looks like we have five green lights. Motion passes. Five zero no abstentions. <clears throat> Thank you, trustees. All right, that is the end of the consent calendar. Agenda item B, award contract for architectural services of Dolphol Academy expansion. Dr. Hansen, please. Yes, administration is requesting approval to award a contract to PBK WLC uh, architectural firm for the design of the Del Sol Academy expansion project. A copy of the proposal is included in the back of materials. Administration recommends this evening that the board award a contract to PBK WLC for the design of the Del Sol Academy expansion. Thank you. Regarding agenda item B, award contract for architectural services, Del Sol Academy expansion, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Okay, motion by Trustee Garcia. There is second. I'll second by Trustee Navarro. Any discussion? Inquiring minds? All right. Call for the vote, please. Again, five green lights. You are very persuasive, Dr. Hansen. <laughs> Motion passes. Agenda item C, award contract for construction management services, Del Sol Academy expansion, Dr. Hansen. This is a partnership um, for that project. Administration requests approval to award a contract to California Professional Management for pre-construction pre and construction management services for the Del Sol Academy expansion pro uh, project. They'll be working with, with the architects as we uh, add additional classrooms there at Del Sol as they have reached capacity. Administration this evening recommends the board award a contract with uh, California Professional Management for the construction management of the Del Sol Academy expansion. Regarding agenda item C, award contract for construction management services, Del Sol Academy expansion. Is there a motion to approve? Motion by Trustee Dittweiler. I'll second. Thank you. There is a motion by Trustee Dittweiler, a second by Trustee Regal. Is there any discussion? Just to confirm, that was for the six classrooms that we had seen before last time. Exactly, that's okay. the, related to the uh, the facility update I gave at the previous board. Okay. That's it. How many how many does that add students or 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 what? Right, additional uh, six additional classrooms, you know, average of 30 kids per classroom, so it allows us to, and then looking at the 10-year the 
projections, we, we feel like that's going to cover us for the next decade. So. Astonishing. And when, when we, I think I explained this at the last time, but when we, when we built the building and, and did the planning, we planned for growth. Um, and so that was the, you know, it's going to be located in, in the area that we planned for. All the utilities are there ready to go. So. It's beautiful. Thank you. Any other discussion? See how thorough you are. All right, call for the vote, please. Five green light. That's what I like to see at this time of night. Agenda item D, award contract for architectural services trust. Street Elementary School Modernization, Dr. Hansen. Yeah, if you recall in the, the presentation last board meeting, I had, uh, brought up a trust, a trust Street Elementary that we would be bringing a, a contract uh, uh, with Runau Clark Architects. We're proposing uh, that, that they design uh, the modernization of that school. So we're requesting this evening, an uh, administration requesting approval to award a contract to ruin out Clark Ar Architects for the design of the Trost Street Elementary School Modernization Project um, for the amount of 1197000 so that we can begin that process. Regarding agenda item D, award contract for architectural services, Trost Street Elementary School Modernization, is there a motion to approve? I'll move to approve. Motion. Second. Motion by Trustee Regal, second by Trustee Garcia. Any discussion? Trustee Dittweiler. That, that is on par. So there's a sliding scale that's used in the state for architects based on uh, the cost of the project. So and that's to allow for fair, fair pricing um, and so that's that's consistent with the the scope of the of the project. Uh, we've Ms. got a Chelsea Dewiler, Can you please speak to the microphone? I cannot hear you. Uh, it's a what? It's like a percentage, right? It's a sliding scale. So, for example, it, um, new construction is nine percent of the first five hundred thousand. Then that been, that that percentage goes up for the next five hundred thousand. Uh, up, so it, it slides and, and adds um, based on the, the, the total cost of the project. So this is a $25 million project, so that's uh, consistent with, uh, with those services. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And is that where we were building the new school on the playground and then tearing down the old one? Or we, is that the plan or are we just remodernizing? So now that once we get the contract in place, then the architects will start uh, evaluating the site and start doing a cost analysis of modernizing the existing site versus uh, building a new school and tearing down, or maybe even a combination of both, new kind of like what we did uh, at some of the other sites, new construction and modernization, a combination of both. But um, until, until the contract's approved, they can't uh, begin that process. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any further discussion? All right, call for the vote, please. Thank you, five green lights. Agenda item E, certify the 2020-2021 second interim financial report, Mrs. Ford. Thank you, and I believe there's a presentation coming up. So, um, I'll start off just by you know talking a little bit about you know in in December the board certified the first interim financial report. I know that was at um, our two new, newest board members. That was your first meeting, and just we just threw you right in there, um, which always happens in December. Tonight, administration is requesting the board certify the second interim financial report. So this interim uh, this interim report uh, actually looks at our expenditures up through January 31st of 2021. So it's looking at our revenue that has come in, our expenditures, and what we anticipate the end of the, uh, our balance to be at the end of the year. Um, so both reports uh, have to be provided to the board. 
the government will know later than 45 days after we close the period um, ending the report. So after that January 31st date. So looking at the revenues, I'll just go briefly through our revenues and our expenditures uh, for our second interim. In our first interim budget, you can see our anticipated revenues and expenditures there. In our second, uh, the second interim, which is what we're bringing to you this evening, um, there is a change in those expenditures. So from the first interim to, uh, for, excuse me, a change in those revenues. From the first interim to the second interim, you can see that our LCFF revenue increased by 2.7 million. However, we had federal revenue that decreased by um, almost a million. But ultimately, uh, our increase in revenues is, is $2 million uh, since uh, the first interim budget. Uh, for expenditures, you can see that our overall expenditure change, but, and this is both in our unrestricted general fund and our restricted general fund, is uh, $6 million in less expenditures. So this is in savings. And uh, originally in first interim, we anticipated we would be spending $261.5 million by the end of the school year. Uh, now we're looking at uh, an estimate of $255.4 million by the end of the school year. So we anticipate we're going to see that additional $6 million in savings. And that is primarily due to distance learning, uh, not um, uh, decreased expenditures in professional development, decreased expenditures for special education transportation costs, which we had an outside contract and we're not, uh, we're not using that outside contract at this time. Uh, so several contract areas, that's why you see the services, that would be where those contracts would fall. And you can see there's a big savings of $3.4 million there. So if we look at the multi-year projection, so um, as, as a reminder from the first NRM report, we always have to provide a three-year outlook. Uh, we're uh, one of the few entities, or actually the only entity in the state, uh, or government entity that is required to provide a three-year outlook of our budget. So looking at that, um, you can see that we are anticipating that our, B, our um, ending balance will increase by $17 million. Uh, some of that has to do with the one-time funding that we received this year. And then um, in looking at our 2021-22 projected budget, you can see that we anticipate a net increase in the fund balance of $4.4 million. And then um, we anticipate in 2023 that there would be a, de a decrease of $4.6 million in our ending fund balance, or uh, yeah, our ending fund balance. So the, re the reason for that is in 22-23, we actually will experience the result of our uh, declining enrollment. We won't experience that in 21-22 because we have that hold harmless that was in SB 98. And that means that we are still funded under our 2019-2020 ADA levels, average daily attendance levels. So what will happen is in 2022-23, we will be funded on prior year and less our 2022-23 average daily attendance is higher. And I'll show you what that'll look like uh, here in our in historical enrollment in ADA. So as you can see in 2021-22, in we have a projected hold harmless and that's what we anticipate. And then in 22-23, that full decline will um, be the two, uh, approximately 268 students that we declined this year. We're anticipating another decline of 244 students next year. And then the following year would be a decline of about 88. And that's what in our, that's what's in our multi-year projections. So uh, the, the, enroll, the decline in enrollment will impact our average daily attendance and, uh, and that's where you see that come in, into play in 2022-23. The other area where you'll see uh, an impact is with the STRS and the PERS rates. Um, we were very thankful that the governor uh, and the legislature, when they passed the budget in July, they passed a two-year buy-down 
of our rate for STRS and PERS. So you see those reflected here on the percentage rate. So it was a 16.15 percent that that would have went up to 17 uh, point something percent, um, but it didn't. It stayed. It went to 16.15. In 21-22, it's the 16.02, so it actually goes down. And then in 22-23, it goes back up to the statutory rate for SERS, which is 18.1%. The same thing will happen for our PERS. We'll see it go up to the 25.5%. So when that happens, uh, we will experience about a $3 million increase in our pension, um, our pension obligations at that time. So that is a brief summary of the second interim. I, I knew we would have a long meeting this evening. I wanted to try to keep it brief, but if you have any questions, please let me know. Please. So can, can you go back to the graph that showed the enrollment in the ADA? Mm -hmm. Now it looks to me like the percentage the difference is increasing in 21, 22, and 22, 23. Um, why is that? We, we have good attendance in virtual learning. We don't expect it to be so good in real learning or, uh, excuse me, brick and mortar learning. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, can you just, yeah. Yeah. That gap there is 95.7. The red and the blue, mm -hmm. not bigger than the gap between the red and the 97.1. I'm looking at that fraction. That, that's kids that are sick, right? So are MER routine mm -hmm. air filters going to uh, squeeze that down on me? Um, no. no. So for 21-22, for we will actually be funded on the same amount. But we are anticipating that we're going to have a decline. If you look at the blue lines for enrollment, the blue, um, the blue portion of the chart, you'll see that the, it looks like that or the enrollment is dropping. Yeah, I understand that. My, my okay. question is about the difference between the red and the blue. How do you calculate that? Well, how do you figure out what you expect the ADA to be? The 95.7%? The that's you're asking how you calculate that? Well, what is it? Well, first question is that 95.7% mm -hmm. of what? So it's 95.7% of our students are, that's what, that would be our average daily attendance. Okay, so when you, you look at across- 95.7% on any given day. So across the 180 days, we take percent, we take uh, the number of students that are enrolled each day, we average uh, that, or we provide the percentage across the entire 188, 180 days of school. And that comes out to the 95.7%. So why are we at 97.1 this year? Or we're at a higher number this year. 95.7 is just a historical average? Yeah, so not, we, we always will anticipate based on what we've seen in the past. And so the 95.7 is what we'll budget at for 21-22. And then we Obviously, as we get our projections in and we submit projections, which we submit projections in December, uh, excuse me, we submit attendance projections in, Dece in December, and then we submit attendance again in um, March of each year. And when we do that, we'll, we're able to certify actual attendance. So we just project our attendance at oh, between 90, 95 and 96%. If you look through 17 through 19, the 95.7 is pretty standard to what's going on there as well. Yeah. So we just project based on what we have historically seen. And we, because this is how our funding comes in and we project conservatively, we always take the more conservative projection. So we'll stay between the 95 and the 96%. It's uh, the 97% is unusual to happen. Um, one percent, um, I have to look at it, I think it's about two million. Mm -hmm. 
under, under, yes, and we do. We focus, uh, our schools focus a great deal on attendance and identifying students that, you know, are, are in need of support to be able to ensure that they are attending. You're welcome. Any other discussion? Very good. Regarding agenda item E. Oh. oh, please. Go on, I didn't, I didn't see. What? I just want to make a motion. We haven't made a motion, have we? So I'll move that we approve that. Thank and I'll you. I'll have some discussion after. Okay. And I have a question. So typically we need to keep 3% in the reserve. And of course, this, looking at these numbers, this is quite the abundance that we're going to be carrying over year from year. Mm -hmm. What happens, I mean, if, you know, typically, in the past, if you don't spend it, you lose it the following year. And I know under the circumstances, a little bit different. So what has been, did they make arrangements saying like, we're not going to take your money away if you don't spend it all? Yeah. So um, uh, um, the majority of this has to do with obviously the situation we're in with distance learning and then one-time funds that we provided. Uh, it's in normal situations, the one-time funds would be very restricted in what you could use them for. They were not as restrictive this time when they when they came in because we were in the situation that we were in. So we were able to offset quite a bit of our costs. Um, that's not typically what happens. And that's why, you know, when you say, if we don't spend it, we would lose it. That would be that situation. In this case, these funds are available multiple years. So we, don't, we do not have to use them in one year. So. Like, will there be extra money spent in years to catch up? Like, that we didn't use many books of supplies. We're not going to have to spend twice as much a year from now, right? No, but we'll go back to normal level. Okay. So what we anticipate is once school starts to open, then we're going to start seeing our books and supplies go back to the normal levels. But you know, we don't have to go back and catch up. Okay. Thank you. One second. As many of these funds are one time but can be extended over more than one year. So part of it will come out like the state will require is requiring yet another plan at the end of this year of how what we're doing to support learning. So if they're not spent, the re if and those are typically the CARES and the COVID relief funds, those would have to be spent by the end of that term. The, LK, the LCFF funds can be carried over. So it's whatever the funding nature legislative um, mandate of those fund, particular funds are. I think some of the federal funds go into 2023. I forget mm -hmm. the month. September. No, September. Uh, it's off by two. Um, the, the COVID relief funds, I think, are a two year thing on the, so, yeah. So August of 2022. Right. So they all have differing deadlines, but your, our base funding, our LCFF funding, that can be carried over as long if we're meeting other formulas within the state requirements, mm -hmm. some of which are off the table this year. <laughs> so, so what what we look at is we look at what what is allowable under any of the federal funding, and we make sure that we we purchase you know whatever we can with those most restrictive funds first, and then what is unrestricted, and we're able to, as Mr. Dushan stated, if we're able to carry those over then those would be the last funds that we would use to be able to make those expenditures. Okay. Motion by Mr. Garcia. I'll second. Thank you. President, now, President Bradford, I've got a question. Please. We get excited. So Mrs. Ford, thank you for the report. I have a couple questions. So the first one is, so we, the SERP, is there any impact on the stirs and purrs? that shows up in the, in the second interim? Um, at this time, no. What we like to do um, when, because we, we don't have all of the information on the cost of the SERP at this point, we're not able to put the expenditure in. So we don't usually put, you know, the corresponding reduction. Um, as soon as we know what the, what the cost of the SERP will be for us and have that, then we will also put the reduction uh, in is what the savings will be for us. 
Okay. Uh, and that includes the STRS savings okay. and the PERS savings. So the second question, um, <clears throat> if the board were to decide to, to adopt the plan to reopen, um, there's that $20 million. Is that, would we have to do a third interim report or how does that work? No, and so um, that, that funding won't be released. The, uh, the initial, it'll be released in 50% uh, apportionment Enforcement, so we'll get two enforcements. One will be in May, and the other one will be in August. So we'll, uh, when we receive that funding in May, we would bring that to the board as part of the adopted budget in June. Okay, thank you. So that funding is not included in the second interim report. More discussion? All right, let's call for the vote. They're regarding agenda item B, e, certify 2020-2021 second interim financial report. Call for the vote. Hello. Five clean lights. Motion passes. Agenda item F, approved submittal of winter 2021 release of consolidated application. Mr. Dubrovsky, please. Thank you. The consolidated application is our application for federal funds, Title I, Title II, Title III, Title IV. It's a yearly thing and there's a cycle. We submit the application, they give us tentative budget amounts, then they give us the final budget amounts and we resubmit the application with the final amount. So that's, that's uh, today's task. Administration recommends approve, you approve submittal of the winter 2021 release of the consolidated application. Move to approve. Thank you. Is second. there a second? I'll second. Was that Trustee Navarro? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Is there any discussion on this? None. Call for the vote, please. Motion passes five zero. Agenda item G adopt resolution number twenty twenty one slash nineteen. Resolution of the Board of Education of the Harupa Unified School District authorizing the issuance and sale of its 2021 general obligation refunding bonds, federally taxable, in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $45 million, and approving certain other matters relating to said bonds. Mrs. Ford. Thank you. So um, in conjunction with the district's finance team, which is listed in your annotation, uh, administration determined that it would be in the best interest of the district and its taxpayers to refund outstanding bonds from two series, from our 2012 refunding of, of the Measure C deal bonds, and then uh, our 2015 Measure E, e uh, series deal, uh, series A deal bonds. The refinancing of the bonds does not extend the term of the of the, the bonds, so the maturity dates remain as they are, um, but we're currently expecting that it would generate uh, approximately three million in savings to district taxpayers over the life of the bonds. So what that means is that you know you're not going the taxpayers will not see like a tremendous uh, reduction in their uh, in their tax payments for the bonds, but they they will we estimate it will be about a dollar and twenty seven cents per $100,000 of assessed value that they'll see a reduction. It's really being a good steward of when we have the opportunity to refund and get a lower interest rate and be able to save some long-term funding, you know, over the course of the maturity of the bonds, we look for that opportunity and we work with our uh, finance team to, to make that um, available to us. 
So administration is recommending that the board adopt resolution number 2021-19, resolution of the Board of Education of the Roop Unified School District. Move to right. approve. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Save, save uh, Mrs. Ford's voice. Thank you. Call for the vote. Anything for Paula? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, call for the vote. That's right. My screen is not coming up. All right. Five zero motion passes. Agenda item H approved personnel matters. Item H1, approve revised job description for Director of Nutrition Services, Mr. Brooks, please. Before the board tonight are recommended revisions to the job description for the Director of Nutrition Services. This is a job classification formerly known as the Director of Food Services. These changes will ensure that this job classification is in compliance with the California Department of Education's regulations for this role. In addition to the updated title, which will bring it in line with the name of the Nutrition Services Department, other significant revisions include updates that comply with the CDE's education and training requirements for this job classification. The revised version and the current version of this job description are both included in the backup materials and administration recommends that the board approve the revised job description for the Director of Nutrition Services tonight. Move to approve. Second. Thank you. Call for the vote, please. Since we're speaking in shorthand. Our vote is 5-0 to pass. Thank you very much. Agenda item H2, adopt employee work year schedules or schedules. 2021-22 and 20. 22-23 school years, Mr. Brooks. Thank you. Tonight, uh, before the board, are employee work year schedules being recommended for the 21-22 and 22-23 school years. Appropriate agreements exist with the employee organizations on the areas that affect them. Uh, these work years are being introduced in concert with the next item on the agenda for tonight, the academic calendars. Um, and they have been scheduled in a, in a manner uh, so as to allow our largest group of certificated employees, our teachers, to complete their work year on the last day of May, while a large number of our classified employees will co complete their work years on June 1st. Uh, in both cases, it will allow those groups of employees to continue on their current payroll cycles. Um, this time, administration is recommending that the board adopt the employee work year schedules for the years 21-22 and 22-23. Thank you. Do I have a motion regarding agenda item H2, adopt employee work year schedules? Move to approve. I'll Thanks. second. Thank you. Call for the vote, please. Passes five zero. 
agenda item H3, adopt the 2021 slash 2022 and 2022 slash 2023 academic school year calendars, Mr. Brooks. Administration is recommending academic school year calendars for the upcoming 21-22 and 22-23 school years. Because these calendars must work in concert with the employee work years, uh, which have also been brought forward and approved tonight, necessary meet and confer discussions with both CSEA, which, who represent our classified employees, and NEA Harupa, who represent our certificated employees, have occurred. Uh, both of these calendars ensure that current pay cycles of 10 months for our teachers and 11 months for a majority of our classified employees will continue. Thank you. The last motion of the evening, who would like to make it? I'll move to approve. Thank you. I'll second. Thank you. Um, call for the, hey, thank you. We are unanimous in our thinking. The motion passes. Agenda item I, board member committee reports. Trustee Garcia, would you like to start? Thank you, President Bradford. <clears throat> uh, I just wanna thank uh, all the commenters today, the public comments. Um, you know, like, like some had mentioned today that um, you know, we do read the emails, we listen to all the comments, and, you know, there's uh, there's no right answer, I don't think. There's no wrong answer, you know. So we'll, we'll have to see how it goes on Wednesday. So, and the vaccinations are starting to flow um, throughout. I think CBS is opening up a lot of um, uh, Walgreens. I know they've been doing some school clinics in some other areas, that I noticed. And, um, and veterans, any veteran over 50 years old, as long as they're enrolled in the VA health system, they can get a vaccine. So if you know any veterans, let them know. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Dabrowski. I forgot to thank you earlier on the uh, LEAP implementation. Great job on that. And then I've, I noticed I looked through the retirement and I thought Mrs. Jockers was on there. Maybe she was on the last one. I just want to recognize some of those teachers that I had personal um, either impacted my students or through community service here in the district. So. Mrs. Jockers is the first one. Ms. Fuller, she did a lot of great work oh. with the Lions Club over the years, uh, FFA. Uh, Ms. Debbie Bush, she is a counselor at Patriots, so my kids got to know her very well. Um, Lorraine Mooney, you know, learned a lot from Lorraine about uh, curriculum and stuff, so gonna miss her too. Uh, Mr. Bynum, of course, mm -hmm. he's always done a great job with nutrition service, I'm gonna miss that barbecue. I know we didn't have it last <laughs> year, but uh, unfortunately on Delegate Assembly, I get to miss it every year because I'm up in Sacramento, but um, if you guys all have a chance in the board to go to that uh, nutrition service barbecue, mm -hmm. I guess we're not gonna have it this year. But anyway, Mike would always barbecue something and did a great job with that. Um, Mr. LeBurn Cook, he's been a, a really good friend and um, mm -hmm. uh, got to you know, miss him. Uh, Kelly Dodd, again, she's a Rotary member. She uh, does a lot of work with the Lions Club as well. So, and Miss Gillette, Hoopa Middle, my kids uh, had her as well. So congratulations to those folks and I wish them all the best in retirement. And that's all I have, thank you. Trustee Navarro, please. I have no committee reports, that is it. Brief is fine. Trustee Regal. You know, um, I do have one committee. I'm just gonna try to be very brief and actually it was one that I was really looking forward to from hearing from Norco College for the CT and um, let me try to do this under two minutes because it's like way past my bedtime. Um, Ashley Etchinson, uh, she's a CTE um, intern associate dean at Norco College. So she's, she brings a lot of experience. I don't know if any of you of our cabinet and administration has worked with her directly, but uh, she'll be covering this role temporarily. Um, 
so really what they're they're focusing on is a current job interest of like how what courses should they be offering with these CTE courses. Um, currently though there are 40 certifications available at Norco College. Um, they've also been able to do a lot of research so they're making sure that these courses and the certifications align with like you know appropriate pay so you know we're not we're, we're getting people within our community the certification they need to make a, an earnable living or affordable living um, you know with a real they have realistic goals they're looking at the schools the businesses um, entre, entrepreneurial essentials um, sharing all specs to entrepreneurs and that's something that we see a lot of people um, have that vision but they don't know how to put it into motion or they attempt without the right guidance and um, sometimes they're just not quite successful. So I'm looking forward to seeing what, you know, if it, whether it's our students or people within our community taking on these courses. Um, all the certification courses at Norco College are free. So whether they're students, you know, that are graduating this year or even parents within our district, um, they are free. So you have 40 certifications. So if there's something that's been piquing your interest or to help you along with your career growth. I think this is a great opportunity to uh, visit that. Several other certifications they're really looking into is the social and behavior science, um, early childhood development. I mean, that's a very popular career, especially I, I, I noticed in our city. So they have the education, the assistance, intervention programs to focus on that um, for people that want to start that career path into the education. Um, art and humanities are really focusing on the music industry and we have a, um, a gentleman that sits on our board advisory board that really is um, I don't recall his first name Don yes that um, is really a music um, advocate and, and um, really pushes it into our community so it's great that we're we're seeing that focus within our Norco College also looking at like some audio um, skills and certifications through that. STEM is really growing. I mean, this is something that is very popular. It seems that it's, it's um, everybody knows it. It's, it's a simple direction and path, but a lot of the career path that we're seeing in everyday world. So um, they're, they're looking at even like the digital architects, the drafting engineering, 3D mechanical free um, engineering certification. Um, it's just definitely all the very cutting edge. So I think that's a great opportunity because it seems that a lot of students have that drive to to have that STEM attached to whatever they're focused on in their future. Um, we're also looking at for Norco College is the computer info systems and then uh, manufacturing. So that used to be their best kept secret, but it's no longer. They have manufacturing um, equipment or buildings within the campus. So you can, this is like mechanical. So you're looking at like the um, numerical controls, programming operators. I mean, we have Amazon and all types of warehouses in our area. So there's a lot of certifications that whether our outgoing students or even like I said, parents and community members, there's a lot of opportunities that they could take up at uh, Norco College. And I want to cut it short and that was it. Four minutes. You're doing fine. Trustee Dittweiler, please. I, I have no committees to report on, but I would like to urge the public that if you want us to read something prior to Wednesday, please send it tomorrow. We have day jobs. And so if you get to us like, like by eight o'clock tomorrow night, I know I, at least I will be able to read and digest them in that time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Between the last board meeting and tonight, I attended my committee meeting, which was the budget meeting. And uh, let's see, what else did I do? I went to a virtual classroom of Dr. Seuss's birthday that I forgot to mention, which was absolutely darling. I miss being with the students and that is what energizes me and why I do this. So, I want to say thank you to everyone for your patience tonight. Thank you to the marvelous IT department as usual. Those who will not speak, but who keep me connected. Thank you, gentlemen.
Josh and, and your marvelous department, Mr. Lewis. And for the 340-ish of all of you listening at home in your jammies and fuzzy slippers, I look forward to that momentarily myself. So we will, please remember, we will reconvene in two days, both online and in the boardroom here. The agenda for that meeting will be posted tomorrow after 4 p.m. And this meeting is concluded at 1033.